as is my custom, I've prepared more material <laughs> than there's time for. But I believe it's urgent, and I'll do the best I can with what I've got. I want to give you a plan that I hope to follow. We're going to be dealing with Second Chronicles, chapters 28 to 32. Last year, when I had the joy of being with you, we were dealing with a New Testament passage out of the Gospel of John, dealing with the true shepherds of the flock of God over against the hirelings. But the passage in front of us this weekend is a passage that deals with the kingship of Hezekiah, one of the most astonishing and helpful passages in all of the Old Testament. It appears to me to fall into four sections, the first of which I've entitled, Something is Wrong, and it deals with chapters 28, starting at verse 1, and runs on into the 29th chapter at verse 9. The second section, something must be done. Chapter 29, picking up at verse 3, and running through chapter 30, verse 9. The third division, something must happen. Chapter 29, verse 36, through chapter 30, verse 27. And finally, something must change. Chapter 31, verse 3, through chapter 32, verse 33. We were told last night that this is the 16th Cedars Conference. And Bob explained that I was not invited the first year. Bob didn't know me. I didn't know him. He'd never heard of Richard O. Roberts, and I'd never heard of Bob Dixon. We certainly didn't know there was such a thing as Cedars Conference. But we were invited the second year, and to my astonishment, and thanks to the Lord, I have been invited every year since. At the close of every year, I thought to myself, well, they probably won't invite me again. <laughs> but uh, I'm thankful to say I have been invited. So we've been here every single year other than the first year and two years ago when something happened. We were planning to come, but strangely, I hadn't really been able to figure out what I was supposed to preach. And I have found on a number of occasions when I don't know what I'm supposed to preach, it usually signifies that I'm not going to get to preach it. <laughs> On the Sunday before Cedars, Margaret was preparing for church, and she slipped and fell in the shower and uh, broke four ribs and was having a really difficult time, but certainly in no sense is breaking your ribs life-threatening. But on Wednesday of that week, I suddenly woke up in the middle of the night and recognized that my wife was stroking my arm. And my first reaction was, well, isn't that lovely? <laughs> We've been married 40 years. That's the first time in the middle of the night she ever showed any affection. I mean, she's a really good sleeper, ordinarily. So I, I was about to praise the Lord. That uh, as sweet as she's always been, it was even getting sweeter. 
But then suddenly, I became alert to the fact something is wrong. She had been sleeping on her left side because of the broken ribs. And it dawned on me she can't be stroking my arm. She couldn't possibly be doing it. I leapt right up. And I turned on the lights. And she was rolling back and forth in the bed. Suddenly she jumped up and ran out of the room, came back in, plopped down on the bed. I said to her, Maggie, you can't do that. You've broken your ribs. I haven't broken any ribs. And that was the last same thing, even though it was erroneous, that she said. She became completely crazy. At first I was fearful It was me. I was somehow misinterpreting what was happening. So I did something I'd never done before. I went and woke our daughter. And she's nearly impossible to wake in the middle of the night. But somehow, eventually I succeeded. And I said, come and observe your mother and see what you think. And so she came into the bedroom. And after a bit, she said, she's absolutely crazy. Well, it took me a while, but eventually I reached a doctor. He said, get her immediately to the hospital. She's apparently had a stroke. And they took her to the hospital. They checked her all out. They said, no, it's, it's not her heart. But after a couple of hours, the doctor said to me, she has the lowest sodium count ever recorded in the history of this hospital. It's remarkable that she's not dead normally, When the sodium sinks that low, they have a convulsion and die. But believe me, I thank God a whole lot. That instead of just thinking how nice it was that she was stroking my arm in the middle of the night, it dawned on this old man that something was wrong. But we're living at a time when the church is acting as if something nice is happening. As if God is stroking our arm. As if we are enjoying his favor to a degree it has never been enjoyed before. Multitudes in the church are blind. And don't have the faintest idea at all that something is dreadfully wrong. Well, you say, fortunately, we at Cedars know better. We know something is wrong. But I believe there's a relationship between knowing that something is wrong and doing what it takes to correct that wrong. Now, I could have lain there in bed that night, and after it dawned on me that something was wrong, I could have said, Lord, something is wrong with Maggie. Now, please, Lord, uh, will you help her uh, to go back to sleep and help me to settle down for the rest of the night? Indications are, had I done that, she would have died. I don't look forward to being a widower. And I thank God that at least on that occasion, instead of looking at the matter in a placid fashion, there was aroused within me an alarm. And a deep knowledge something is wrong. And I have got to act. I couldn't count on her to act. She had no capacity at that point to act. But God enabled me to see what I had to do. 
But has he enabled you to see what you have to do in the midst of this crisis, which is, has already been stated is the greatest crisis in America's history? This next election is not a political matter at all. This is a choice between heaven and hell for America. It has never before been true that the lines are so crystal clear. You vote for evil or you vote for righteousness. But the majority, it appears, who call themselves Christians don't really see it that way. And they see it as an economic issue, as a health care issue, as something of minor consequence. And even those who think something is wrong are saying, oh God, please correct those who are wrong. While I say this gently, even as was prayed this morning, please, Lord, deliver us from the remedial judgment. My dear friends, if you know what's wrong, you won't ask God to deliver us from the remedial judgment. You'll ask God to deliver us from the sin that led to the remedial judgment. We're under God's judgment because we have become offensive to him. Our theme this morning is simply what I have said already. Something is wrong. But I'm begging you at the outset to listen to such a degree that you not only agree with me that something is wrong, but that you feel it to such a degree and that it creates within you such an alarm that you know what to do and do it. Now, even if we could suppose that everyone here already knows something is wrong and is already alarmed, Every one of us is in constant contact with people in the church who don't know it and don't feel it. And I believe the alarm has to strike us in such a way that it becomes contagious. And others who meet us come under the same alarm. I believe that's how God works. He awakens some and the power of his awakening in them is so great that it awakens those around them. But we're going to deal with a passage, as I've already outlined it to you. So uh, let us begin then with care in dealing with this urgent issue as it is set in front of us in the book of Second Chronicles. As I said to you, we begin with chapter 28. Now chapter 28 does not deal with Hezekiah. It deals with Hezekiah's father. And chapter 33 does not deal with Hezekiah, but it deals with Hezekiah's son. We have a three-generational matter in front of us. Indeed, it is actually more extended than that. Before we could, we could obviously be reading before Ahaz and after Hezekiah's son. But I tried to narrow it down to the aspects of the passage that are absolutely mandatory to lay hold of the circumstances and the consequences of what this passage brings to bear. Something was wrong. During the reign of King Ahaz, Hezekiah's father. Look at verse 1 of chapter 28. Ahaz was 20 years old 
when he became king. And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not do right in the sight of the Lord as David, his father, had done. And there are multitudes of Americans who profess to be Christians whose lives could be as simply summarized as the life of Ahaz. For X number of years, 32 years in one case, 45 years in another, 21 here, 66 there. They lived on earth in America, and they did not do right in the sight of the Lord their God. And they surely did not follow in the footsteps of their father, David. But the author of Second Chronicles is not content to give us merely sweeping summary statements. As important as they are, he gives us precise specifics. Look at verse 2. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. And everyone who is acquainted with the books of Kings and Samuel and Chronicles knows that walking in the ways of the kings of Israel is evil. I need not go into detail about the division between Israel and Judah. We are obviously now dealing with that small kingdom of Judah. He, that is Ahaz, walked in the ways of the kings of Israel. Also in verse 2, we read, He made molten images for the Baals. So we are confronted now with a king in Israel who has simply turned himself over with abandonment to the gods of this earth. If the biography were written of the typical evangelical pastor in America, it could simply be said, he worships the gods of this earth. The gods of gold. The gods of pleasure. The gods of size. Bigness is a major God in America. But it goes on with further details. He burned incense in the valley of ben Himmon, chapter 28, verse 3. He burned his sons in fire according to the abominations of the nations whom the Lord had driven out before the sons of Israel, the last half of verse 3. Verse 4, he sacrificed and he burnt incense on the high places, on the hills, and under every green tree. And just in case someone is here who doesn't understand the problem of high places, as has already been said to us this morning, some of the patriarchs, when God had indeed met them in a powerful way, or better perhaps I should say they met God in a powerful way, erected an altar and often in a high place, and there they worshiped God. But the day came when God gave specific details about the temple 
to be built and the location of that temple and the order of worship to be conducted in that ordained place. And when that temple was in place, worship in the high places was illegitimate. And as you trace through the history of the kings of Israel, you see this constant rising and falling. One king tears down the high places, and the next king, it seems, raises up again the high places. In the little pattern we're looking at this morning, we have Ahaz worshiping in the high places. We have Hezekiah tearing down the high places. And then we have Manasseh, the son of Hezekiah, returning to the high places. The high places obviously represent illegitimate worship, worshiping God as it pleases man, worshiping man's gods instead of the God who reveals himself in sacred scripture. What an account this is of a man whose whole life is represented, as I pointed out already, with the simple expression, he did not do right in the sight of the Lord his God. And then drop down to verse 16 of chapter 28. At that time, King Ahaz sent to the kings of Assyria for help. If you sit down and reflect upon this passage, it becomes apparent that a nation whose God is the Lord does not need the assistance of other nations. That's part of the problem we're facing at the moment. One candidate who wants to turn things over to other nations. If God is our God, and one man and God constitute a majority, what would we need with the help of the Assyrians or the Philistines or the French, or the Spanish, or the Koreans, or anyone else. But Ahaz was so grievously distant from God that he had no confidence that an enemy could be faced without the aid of outsiders. And indeed, in his movement to gain the help of others, he brought his nation into the most grievous kind of difficulty. Look at verse 19. For the Lord humbled Judah because of Ahaz, king of Israel. For he had brought about a lack of restraint in Judah. I remember very well the year at Cedars when I was preaching on the subject of regeneration. And I believe in the first message, I said, I'm going to give you 12 evidences of death. Twelve things that prove that a person cannot be regenerate. And then with a great deal of apprehension and yet certainty as to the wisdom of it, I said to you, I want you to think in terms of President Bill Clinton, who claims to be a born-again man. And I want you to weigh his life as it is publicly known over against these 12 evidences of death. 
I don't care what your political party is. I don't even care what mine is. Whenever a leader in any position, be it in federal government, be it in state government, be it in local government, be it in the church, whenever a leader causes the people to lose a sense of restraint, you know that that body is headed for incredible trouble. Our nation has lost all sense of restraint. And to even make that worse, we have spread abroad to the nations of the world our interpretation of freedom. Maggie and I were in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee recently, and she spotted a sign which she recited to me. And the sign said, freedom is the right to be wrong, but not to do wrong. Let me repeat that. Freedom is the right to be wrong, but not to do wrong. And for many, many years in America, we understood that people have a right to be wrong. We don't expect everybody to see every issue in the same light. And when all the facts are marshaled and laid out in front of people, some will draw the wrong conclusions. We know that. And part of freedom is to say, if you are wrong in your judgments, you have that right. But it has been decided by our Creator what is right and wrong in terms of conduct. And you don't have any rights to be wrong only, or, or to do wrong, only the right to be wrong, to think wrong wrong thoughts, to draw wrong conclusions. But we have passed through such a season of moral and spiritual declension that the restraints are removed, and now our leadership, in many cases, thank God not at the White House at the moment, but the Vice President has the gall to declare that people have a right to be homosexuals. No! That is God's determination. And God has made it crystal clear. You have no rights in that regard. But multitudes of Americans won't hesitate to vote into office men who say freedom is the right to be wrong and to do wrong. But are you, by the grace of God, wise enough to know the difference? And have you felt so deeply the problem that something is wrong, that you will not in any fashion help those who are determined to see that all restraints are removed. Over and over I've asked individuals and groups if it's all right for the homosexuals to organize and to plan and to convince everybody that homosexuality is all right. Why shouldn't child molesters have the same rights? Why shouldn't murderers have the same rights? Why shouldn't common thieves have the same rights? Freedom is the right to be wrong, but not to do wrong. But Ahaz chose to do evil. Now listen, once the choice is made to do evil, the ability to discern right from wrong ceases.
the nature of depravity is such that its first impact on the individual life and on society is to create a blindness so that individuals and entire nations are utterly unable to discern right from wrong. We have records of this in Scripture. But here is Asa. Here is this king uh, who has slipped so deeply into iniquity that King Ahaz himself has created a spirit where there is a lack of restraint in Israel. And notice what is added at the end of verse 19. This lack of restraint in Judah. And very unfaithful to the Lord. Now, I'm asking you, not if you agree with the Scripture. I hope you do. Shame on you if you don't. And why do you pretend to be a Christian if you balk at the very Word of God? But my concern is not do you agree with the text, but do you feel it deeply? Has it gripped you? Has it brought about a state of alarm. And are you acting as a man of God or a woman of God in the light of the obvious truths before us? Notice what it says in verse 21. He took a portion out of the house of the Lord and out of the palace of the king. And he gave it to the kings of Assyria. It seems to me it would have been bad enough to have sought to hire the Assyrians to fight on Judah's behalf. But to go into the very temple of the Lord and to take the tithes and the offerings and to take the sacred vessels, and to offer them to an alien king, a God-hating king, for aid surely demonstrates the depth of the depravity of this man who served as king. And then we read these almost astonishing words in verse 22. In the time of his distress, he became yet more unfaithful to the Lord. You might almost say, how could he have? It sounds as if he had lost all faith in the Lord already. But isn't it astonishing how low one can sink once they cease to repent and call upon the name of the Lord. It appears that there is no limitation on the depth of iniquity. Ten, twelve years ago, I was thinking to myself and occasionally even giving voice to the thought, surely America has reached the bottom. We really can't go any lower, can we? <laughs> yes, it's quite obvious that we could go lower. And uh, right now, many of us are feeling we really have hit the bottom, haven't we? Well, we may have hit all bottoms ever hit by any other generation before. But that doesn't mean that there isn't yet a bottom beneath the bottom. And that we might even sink lower in all of his evil. And in all of his distress, he yet became even more unfaithful. 
surely you have learned by now that the depth of iniquity is not ordinarily that which turns one back to righteousness. That which turns one back to righteousness is the goodness of God. Henry gave us an important word this morning. He and I have shared this word all over this nation and other nations of the world. That when you study your Bible, you discover that the judgments of God fall into two great realms. The remedial judgments and the final judgments. You understand that by now. This has been a theme oft voiced at the Cedars Conferences But I'm not so sure you do understand it. I wonder, have you really grasped this? It is, I repeat, the goodness of God that leads us to repentance. God has already brought us under remedial judgment. Don't go around saying, if God judges us, he has judged us. I echo what Henry said. 9-11 was a judgment from God. There are only 3,000 some or 4,000 some killed. In the passage in front of us, we're going to see an occasion when 200,000 citizens of Judah were put to death. Apparently that's what we're waiting for. A few thousand, what does that matter? We can handle that. Mighty America can surely cope with a loss of a few thousand. I don't see that 9-11 has inspired repentance. Yeah, but you said the righteousness, the goodness of God. Well, it seems to me when an entire nation deserves to die and only... Less than 5,000 die. That's a mighty great act of goodness. You remember that account in 2 Samuel where David went down with the priest and the leaders to recover the ark which the Philistines had taken captive and uh, they sought to bring it back to its rightful place in Jerusalem and that farmer boy reached up to steady the ark And God struck him dead just like that for touching the ark. That was a remedial judgment. Who deserved to die? David. All the priests and all the leaders, they're the ones that sinned against God. But no, God in his goodness spared them and made an example of one farm boy. Here we have examples of God's goodness in front of us. And there's no evidence at all that his goodness has inspired us to repentance. What does that lead us to conclude? That his remedial judgments will become more severe. Until that point when he ceases to be gracious. And his righteous indignation burns with such fury that it's all over. I'm asking you, do you feel the depth of the fact that something is wrong? Let me return to my Bible and to this text and ask you to notice in addition verse 23 he sacrificed to the gods of Damascus which had defeated him and he said I will sacrifice to them that they may help me but they became the downfall of Ahaz and all Israel. 
but still in his blindness and stupidity, he proceeded in his declension. Verse 24, he cut the utensils of the house of God in pieces. Verse 24 again, he closed the doors of the house of the Lord. Verse 24 again, he made altars for himself in every corner of Jerusalem. Verse 25, he made high places to burn incense to other gods in every city in Judah. And then once again, verse 25, the last portion. He provoked the Lord God of his fathers to anger. Now the rest of his acts and all his ways, from the first to the last, behold, they're written in the book of kings, the kings of Judah and Israel. So Ahaz slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city in Jerusalem, for they did not bring him into the tombs of the kings of Israel. And Hezekiah, his son, reigned in his place. Now, there's a consequence for that kind of action. Let's go backward to the fourth part of the chapter. Look at verse 5. Wherefore the Lord his God delivered him into the hands of the king of Syria, and they defeated him, and carried away from him a great number of captives and brought them to Damascus. He was also delivered into the hands of the kings of Israel, who inflicted him with heavy casualties. For Pekah, the son of Remaliah, slew in Judah 120,000 in one day. I think I said 200 and was mistaken. 120,000 in one day. They were all valiant men, but they had forsaken the Lord God of their fathers. Then in verse 8, the sons of Israel came, and they carried away captive of their brethren 200,000 women, sons and daughters, And it took a great deal of the spoil from them. And they brought the spoil to Samaria. But even that doesn't seem to be the end of it. Verse 9, a prophet of the Lord was there, whose name was Oded. And he went out to meet the army which came to Samaria And he said to them, because the Lord, the God of your fathers, was angry with Judah, he has delivered them into your hand, and you have slain them in a rage, which has even reached heaven. And then the prophet goes on to tell Israel what's going to happen to them even though God allowed them to be instruments of great evil against Judah, they were going to have to pay a price for their grievous wickedness. Now surely you must understand, the same as God was able to deliver Judah into the hands of Syria and Judah into the hands of Israel, and Judah into any other hands he chose, the very same God is able to deliver America into the hands of the terrorist. 
And there's every reason to believe he will. There's an awful lot of confidence among some of our leaders that we're stronger than they and wiser than they. But our battle is not against the Muslims. Our battle is with our own God. And there are none stronger than he. And when God is angry with his own people, he turns them over to his own enemy. And if we are destroyed by alien nations, that does not suggest that those alien nations then are suddenly in God's favor. They, like Israel, as recorded in chapter 8, are going to pay a huge price for their evil, but that doesn't keep God from allowing his own enemies to defeat his own people who will not repent in a timely fashion, who are not wise enough to really recognize something is wrong. But it was not only Ahaz who to a minor degree was aware that something was wrong. But when we come to chapter 9, or 29, we immediately recognize that there's a young king, only 25 years of age, who is vastly more sensitive and wise than his father. Hezekiah became king when he was 25 years old. And he reigned 29 years in Jerusalem. Verse 2, he did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his fathers had done. But look at verse 6. Our fathers have been unfaithful and have done evil in the sight of the Lord our God and have forsaken him and turned their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord and have turned their backs. They have also shut the doors of the porch and put out the lamps and have not burned incense or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Therefore, O dear brothers and sisters, lay hold of the words of verse 8. Therefore, the wrath of the Lord was aroused against Judah and Jerusalem. And he has made them an object of terror, of horror, and of hissing, as you see with your own eyes. And would I be wrong if I said to you, brothers and sisters, therefore the wrath of the Lord is against America, And against Dallas. And he has made us an object of terror and horror and of hissing, as you can see with your own eyes. My dear brothers and sisters, I remember very well the days of old as a young man in the ministry of the gospel. I remember serving in a wild, ragged, virtually frontier town in the state of Washington and seeing God move powerfully through the preaching of his word I walked into an automobile garage one day there was no one around in the office I let the door slam as I entered the shop for I saw that all the mechanics were over in a corner in a huddle And I could tell by what was happening, they were telling dirty jokes. But when the door slammed, one man looked up and I heard him 
whisper, "Uh uh-oh, the preacher's here. And immediately that that group of men stood erect and said, sorry, reverend, we didn't mean for you to hear that. I didn't hear it. But there was a time when a respect was given to the servants of God. We didn't crave it. We didn't even deserve it. But the name of our God was still regarded as holy in the land. And if a man swore in front of a woman, he quickly apologized. But nowadays, if a group of men are telling a dirty joke, they invite the pastor over to join them, and he's very apt to know something even more filthy than any of them. Surely, It is no exaggeration to say that in his burning anger the Lord has made us an object of terror, of horror, and of hissing, and you see it with your own eyes. But I ask you, does seeing it alarm you? What would you think of me if I came to the Cedars this year And I told you about the conduct of my wife. And I said to you, when I turned on the light, I could see she had become a raging maniac. And I said to myself, well, I'm just going to go back to bed. And if God wills that she should die, well, I leave it in God's hands. No, you know as deeply as I do. When we face situations like that, we must act. And if we don't, there is a judgment for us of great severity. And here, the evidence is overwhelming of the trouble that we are in as a people. And our tendency is to come to the cedars and to get filled with joy, and to go home and act the same way we acted before we came. So the short of what I've just said is, thank God, when Hezekiah came to the throne, he knew something was wrong. Look at these verses now. Verse 8, God has made them an object of terror, of horror, of hissing. As you see with your own eyes, verse 9, Our fathers have fallen by the sword, our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity for this. He knew something was wrong And he knew what that wrong was. He knew the cause of the evil. He knew the the role of God in the horror that was happening. But he also knew that when you see something is wrong... you know something must be done. And he did it. But thus far, we haven't. That's the sad truth. We haven't. In all these years in which my heart has been stirred over these matters, in all the delightful years, I've had the joy of associating with the Blackabees and the Owens and others who have participated in the leadership of these conferences with you dear brothers and sisters who come so often. I haven't seen anything change for good. It just all seems to drift downward continually, maybe with momentary interruption, but never with any serious change. Well, what I've said to you is, 
Ahaz did wrong, and Hezekiah knew that something is wrong. When there are millions of sheep who have no shepherd, something is wrong. When there are untold numbers of converts who are unconverted, something is wrong. When there is no apparent difference between the church and the world, something is wrong. When ministers of the gospel are better public relations men than preachers, something is wrong. When Christians sin without any fear of the wrath of God, something is wrong. When church discipline is abandoned, something is wrong. When holiness is treated as extremism, something is wrong. When preaching is dull and listless and tiresome and powerless, something is wrong. And all of that is wrong. But do you feel it? Have you felt it to such a degree that it has taken priority by the grace of God to set things right? Well, you say, I understood in teaching here at the Cedars before that uh, it's only God that can set things right. Yes. Yeah. Yes, that's true. That'll become more evident this evening, I think. But while it's only God who can set things right, he's not going to until we do what we're required. And that's what's breaking my heart. No evidence that we're yet doing what's required. Maggie and I, are members of a church in the Chicago region, which we honestly think is as good as churches come in our generation. We're constantly thankful for our pastors and for their godly burden. They meet with me regularly when I'm home on Friday morning for a protracted season of prayer. But I said to the dear pastors this week, Do you realize, and I acknowledge I'm not always present in the prayer meeting because I'm often away preaching, but I have never been in the prayer meeting of our church when it was not led either by the pastor or myself, when someone else, in other words, was leading, when there was ever any request to pray for national repentance. I cannot remember a single elder in our church or any other leader urging our congregation to pray that we would open our eyes and see what Henry so delightfully opened before us this morning, that God is with us and we have got to join him. I think the pastors were shocked when I pointed this out to them. I said, probably of all the churches in the western suburbs of Chicago, we have more of a prayer spirit than any other church we know about. But we still don't seem to have a burden to lay hold of God for the kind of change that's urgently needed. I dare to say that even after having attended Cedars conferences many times, some of you still have no enduring burden for change. How many times do we have to be told something is wrong? I gave you a list a moment ago of some of the many things wrong in the church. We are electing elders and deacons and pastors to our churches who are neither full of faith or of the Holy Spirit. Without qualms, Christians vote for political leaders 
who are out to destroy the nation and to bring everything down to hell. We have multitudes of young people in our churches who are committing fornication and don't even know the Bible forbids it. Some of them have said to me, what we're doing is right before God. He's the one that made us sexual beings. This is something he takes pleasure in. And if you introduce the word fornication, they look at you stupidly and say, what's that? We have thousands of evangelical churches who take unregenerate people into their membership and don't even know what they're doing. Untold numbers of men and women are graduating from our Bible colleges and seminaries across the land who candidly admit they love God less when they graduate than they did when they enrolled. And still nobody seems to be crying out, something is wrong! Oh God, something is wrong! And I wonder if we ever will call out to God and acknowledge something is wrong until we have exhausted our own resources. The real problem in America is we're so innovative, so inventive, so capable, so well-educated, so full of ourselves that we've always got one more thing to try before we call upon the Lord. But thank God that wasn't the story with Hezekiah. Many of you attend churches where only a small fraction of the membership attend on Sunday. And nobody calls out in alarm, something is wrong. The Lord's day has in most places become the Lord's hour. And don't you dare, Lord, extend it one minute past your hour. And still, no alarm is sounded. Everywhere I go, I meet people who honestly believe that repentance and faith are one-time incidences. Having had a moment of faith and a moment of repentance, they can then call themselves Christian throughout their entire life, even though their life is devoted to sin and self. I'm alarmed by the songs that I hear sung in the church which are focused upon me and my. We had some of that last night, where you would have thought that the purpose of the gospel was to save us from hell, whereas the purpose of the gospel is to save us from ourselves and our sin. What is it going to take to wake us up and to cause us all in mighty alarm to cry out, something is wrong. We know that the world is more powerful in the church than the church is in the world. And yet we shrug our shoulders as if that were normal. There are many men in ministry who are loved by their entire church and their entire community. And many of those who love men in the ministry hate God. How is it possible for a man who loves God to be loved by God-haters. Did not our Lord sound the alarm and make it clear that as they have done to me, so they will do to you? Why are there no martyrs in our day? There are very few who dare to take a stand and call sin, sin and identify wholly with the kingdom of God and make it crystal clear they have no part in the affairs of this life. Their focus is Jesus and Jesus only. And I haven't said a word about Christians fighting Christians, about church prayer meetings 
being either totally eliminated or turned into a ridiculous farce. I haven't said anything about materialism in the church. I've brought with me this time, I shall read portions of it later, but I've brought with me a pamphlet. You won't be able to see this. Uh, for the most part, something must be done. That's where I got the title from, Something Must Be Done. A New Year's sermon preached the last day of the old year by Gardner Spring, pastor of the Brick... Oh, oh, you'll have to forgive me for this, pastor of the Brick Presbyterian Church in the city of New York on the last day of the year, 1815. And... Uh, he said, the city of New York has never had a visitation from God. That was true in 1815. The great revival under George Whitfield and Jonathan Edwards and that mighty band of warriors for Christ didn't touch New York City. So in 1815, the city had never had a spiritual awakening and this dear pastor listed the reasons why. And he said, people come to dr by droves to New York City. And one would suppose that the purpose for God bringing them to New York City was to fill their pockets with gold. They don't seem aware of the fact at all that God brings professing Christians together in order to transform their society. He said the tragedy is so great that most Christians in New York City don't even realize that there is power in Jesus Christ to save believers from their sins. And therefore they go on living in sin as if that were normal, claiming to be saved and yet not identifying with the Savior whom they say is there. But strangely and wonderfully, the sermon was heard. And soon after, the first great revival to touch New York City did. But I'm wondering, what's it going to take? before we're really moved and stirred. What's it going to take to quit us blaming somebody else for what's wrong? Everything that's wrong in America is represented right here at the Cedars, starting with this old man. Something is wrong. Hezekiah knew it. The church ought to know it. And yes, it doesn't seem to. But there is something grievously wrong in the church. And it must also be said there is something amazingly wrong in our society. Children are being sacrificed at this very hour, to the gods of this world. Gold and goods still reign supreme, even as they did in New York City in 1815. And thank God for a season at least, no longer reign. But once again, gold and goods and sex reign in America. What are the great gods of American Christians, the same gods as the gods of this world. Oh, we don't have any Baals. We don't have any Astaroths. But we have the gods of gold and goods and sex and pleasure. The high places have been restored in our day. People worship when and where. They will. And in consequence, we live at a time when what should be offered in sacrifice to God 
is being offered in sacrifice to defeat terrorism. Have you thought about this? Instead of sending 100,000 military personnel to Iraq, we should have sent 100,000 missionaries. Billions and billions of dollars that should be invested in the kingdom of God are being wasted in fighting a war we cannot win because our real enemy is not them but us. And our failure to candidly and fully acknowledge, Oh God, something is wrong! And we know perfectly well that something is wrong with us when our hearts remain unbroken by the awful things that are happening in our nation. When our eyes are still dry, when everything around us should promote literally buckets of tears, When the word of God has power, it seems, in our day, only to arouse for the moment and not to bring about perpetual change. Not obviously because there's a fault in the word of God, but the calluses upon our own hearts have become such that we seem incapable of being moved to tears to brokenness and to the kind of action that is appropriate under the circumstances. Thank God that there were wiser generations that preceded us. If there is a generation that follows us, what hope is there that they will be wiser? Well, we can look at the record of Chronicles and see that Ahaz was rotten and that Hezekiah was good and Manasseh was rotten. But are you clear in your mind how close to the end of it all Hezekiah reigned? Do you know there's not much future for Israel after Hezekiah's period? It's a very short span of time before Israel is cut off. Oh, we live in constant hopes of the day when God will again extend his mercy to Israel. But it's been a great many hundreds of years since Israel knew the kind of grace that Israel once knew. I must close. Something is wrong. Do you feel it? Will that depth of conviction and feeling make a difference all the days of your life? And I would suggest that we close by each again bowing in our place and pleading with our gracious Redeemer to so affect us that we will never again respond indifferently to the terrible realization of how wrong things really are. Now, Lord, I would acknowledge that there are days when I am very much under the heaviness of the realization of how terribly wrong things are, but other days when I seem somehow to thrust it aside and to live as if all is well. I expect some of my brothers and sisters here are similar, but we fear that none of us have yet reached that state where we will act as wisely and as thoroughly as did King Hezekiah. Oh, God, 
Some have come with very hungry hearts, longing that this might indeed be the turning point for each of us individually and even for our society. Oh, we plead that indeed we shall become fully aware of your indignation, your wrath, and yet fully aware of your grace and your mercy, and that we will do precisely what you call upon us to do with all of our hearts to return to the Lord and to do so with such vehemence, such sincerity, such thoroughness that all those around us will be stirred and moved to join us in repentance and faith. We thank you for the years of incredible mercy that our land has known and many other lands of the world, even to some degree through us. If you simply opened the bowels of the earth and swallowed us up as a nation, we couldn't even gasp in horror. We would have to acknowledge as we were falling into the pit the righteousness of our God. But we approach you more as the God of grace even than the God of wrath. For you have shown yourself to be truly a God of everlasting kindness. And we plead that what Israel did not do by the grace of God, we shall do, and that our nation shall turn to you. Just as Hezekiah explained it, they turned to God because God planned it for them. Oh, may it be true of us, we pray, in the dear and glorious name of King Jesus. Amen. Well, I trust that you're ready to look again at Second Chronicles. I gave you my outline this morning, and uh, Lord helping me, I'm going to stick with it. But uh, some of you apparently didn't catch it and have asked about it, and so I'm going to take a moment to repeat it and then to expand upon the basic outline. But before I do so, I want to express once more my own deep appreciation for the way that you have received Maggie and myself over these years. We are, as some of you know, non-Baptist. I think we're Baptist at heart, but our own affiliation has been other than that. And we have for years felt isolation from our own denomination. We haven't suffered anything as a result of the isolation. Good for you. Does make a difference, doesn't it? We haven't suffered anything as a result of the isolation from our denomination, but we've been aware of it. And uh, that's partly why your reception of us has been so meaningful. We've been so very grateful that Southern Baptists have extended us love and hospitality and many opportunities of ministry. But I want to share with you tonight as a prayer request that although it has been years since I had an invitation to speak in my own denomination, they've asked me to be the principal speaker in the annual convention this coming July. <laughs> and I've been so grateful for that opportunity and am hoping and praying that God will indeed speak. And I invite you to pray uh, that this ancient denomination, once, as was said last night, the most vital evangelical body in America, you can scarcely name a great preacher in early American history who was not either a Congregationalist or a Presbyterian. You'd have a hard time naming a famous and a much-used Baptist 
from the early period. But my denomination became the most awful denomination in the land. And multitudes turned completely away from the Lord and the scripture. They're not Christian in, in any sense whatsoever. They're humanist at best. And many of them are just totally rank unbelievers. But there are some who are still seeking the Lord and seeking his favor. And uh, so I share that prayer request with you tonight. But now, let me go back to what I set in front of you this morning as the outline uh, of the passage that uh, we are going to be pursuing. I said it came in four divisions. Now, those who come regularly to Cedars know any number of things. Number one, while there's an awful lot of praying that goes on in advance, there really isn't any planning in terms of what the speakers say. There was just one very short period when the dreadful error was made. And uh, I received two separate and distinct orders concerning what I was to preach upon. I was astonished first to receive the first one and then I almost fell over in a faint when I received the second one which was totally different from the first one and no explanation at all of the whole matter. But by and large we just speak what the Lord puts upon our hearts. And uh, I think many of you who have been here before have felt something of the awe and the wonder of the harmony of what is said. I felt that first thing this morning. I thought God is with us. We're not going to be contradicting one another. We're all going to come at these same issues, but from different perspectives. But the Lord is going to bring it all together into one glorious message that by his grace will permanently impact our lives and our society. So as I prepared my heart for my portion in these weekend meetings, very quickly it became clear to me that I was supposed to deal with Second Chronicles 28 to 32. And as I poured over the passage, it appeared to me there were four matters that I had to take up. Now, I didn't come with a presumption that because I had four messages, I would be given four opportunities to share. Now, I just came with the understanding there were four great issues I needed to speak out of, uh, speak about out of this passage. And uh, so it is my intent to take, as I did this morning, the first, and tonight the second, and then tomorrow in one message the two. But I want you to understand the construction as I said this morning, we are going to deal with something is wrong, and that we have dealt with. This evening, something must be done. And tomorrow, something must happen, and uh, something must change. I want to identify the portions for those who wish to have these down and didn't catch them this morning. Something is wrong, 28.1 to 29.9. Something must be done, 29.3 to 39. Something must happen. 29, 36 to 30, 27, and something must change. 31, 3 to 32, 33. Now there's some overlap there. But I want to explain to you now how important this arrangement of divine truth is. This is not my outline. 
This is merely an outline of the passage. These are the truths in the order in which they appear in the passage. The very first issue is our understanding of a need. Who is ever going to pray for revival who doesn't understand how desperately needed it is? Something is wrong. A number of years ago, I became very burdened for our own city, Wheaton, Illinois, which has been described as the Evangelical Vatican. At one time, there were more evangelical Christian organizations in Wheaton, Illinois, 60-some, than in any other city of any size. Wheaton is a very small town in comparison with Dallas. We've been in Wheaton approximately 30 years. And one of the first things we discovered upon moving to Wheaton was simply this. Wheaton is closer to hell than any other place we had ever been in our lives. And the reason we came to that conclusion was simply this. To whom much is given, much is required. And Wheaton, it appeared to us, was a city of dead works. Not totally, but nonetheless to a massive degree. And we became very burdened for our city. And after being there some years and becoming somewhat well acquainted with the overall situation, I talked with a pastor of the most influential church. And I said, you know, the conviction that I have is that you can get people from the country to come to the city, but you can't get the city to go to the country. You can get the pastors of little churches to go to a meeting in the big church, but you can't get the pastors of the big churches to go to a meeting in a little church. I believe that one who is given the opportunity of service in a major church receives with that opportunity of service heavy obligations. He is to realize that God has given him an upper position in order to lift those around him and to be a source of help and encouragement. I said to this pastor, it appears to me that we have absolutely no spiritual leadership in this city. There is not one pastor that I can discover who is encouraging and helping and elevating all the believers in the community and assisting. It appears that each church is trying to get bigger itself, even if it's at the sacrifice of the smaller church. And I said, if you would be willing, I would be deeply grateful if you would call together the pastors of all the large churches in this city and give me an opportunity of addressing them. He said, let me see what I can do. So in a little while he called and he said, the arrangements are made. We'll meet in my study. And he named the hour and the day. And so I went and sat down with the pastors of the major churches in the community. And I said to them something on this order. Since being in Wheaton, I have come to realize how desperate the spiritual need is. This is a has-been city. This is a place that has a reputation that it doesn't live up to. This is a place where spiritual coldness prevails over passion. 
and fire. This is a place in desperate need of spiritual leadership. Now, providentially, when these men came together in this pastor's office, one man went up to another and said, Oh, uh, I'm so-and-so. I don't think I know who you are. And he gave his name and his church. And the first man said, Oh, you're new to town, aren't you? Yes, he said, I've only been here four years. And another man greeted another, and he said, why, it's got to be at least three years since I've seen you. And I said, thank you, Lord, this helps. <laughs> so I said to these men, you think of yourselves as the spiritual leaders of this community. But you're only kidding yourself. You're not the leaders of the community. Probably you're not even really the spiritual leaders of your own church. But if indeed you are, somebody needs to lead this community. And I'd ask you to come together today through the voice of this pastor in order to lay on you, if God will enable, a burden for our city to try and bring our city to its knees before our God. And I made three particular suggestions. I said to them, there is no pastor's prayer meeting in this city. Some of the younger men in the smaller churches have talked about it, but not one of them would be effective in drawing the city together, and I named the principle that I shared with you about getting the country into the city, but not getting the city into the country. And uh, I said, if the pastors of this area are to be drawn together in a prayer meeting, you're the ones that are going to have to call this prayer meeting and set the example and keep the thing fervent in the life. There are a couple other things that I spoke to and then I said to them we are living at a time when the word revival is virtually a meaningless word to most people because all they think of is some wild extreme some ridiculous Pentecostal who claims uh, he's the pastor of the revival center tabernacle or some other sheer nonsense or some southern Baptist who has a revival and can put out a big banner out front, revival, three nights only. <laughs> <laughs> and our people desperately need an understanding of what revival is. I said, there are large auditoriums available in this community, and a very fortunate thing all of the churches that have evening service have it at 6 o'clock. That means that a series of revival lectures could be given on Sunday night in one of these major communities at 8 o'clock and all true believers would be free from their own church responsibilities to come together. I would like to urge you to Join with me in a series of lectures on revival. I, I would suggest some simple rules. If you're going to be one of the men who gives a lecture on revival, you're going to have to commit yourself to attend when everyone else speaks on the subject. I said it would only defeat its purpose if you came and gave your lecture and didn't hear the rest of the series. And I... Enlarge the whole concept. And when I finished, I said, I believe it would be appropriate to receive your responses. And the man in whose office we met, and the man who, as I've said, called the other men together, spoke up first. And he said, I believe that God himself has put this burden on Mr. Robert's heart, and he has conveyed 
I believe the burden of the Lord to us. I am prepared right now to commit myself 100% to all of the suggestions he has made, but I am going to do so on one single provision. And that provision is that the rest of you join me in a hundred percent commitment. He said, I know some of you too well to commit myself to do something like this and have you come into it halfway. One hundred percent. Will you join me? The second man kind of stuttered around a little bit and uh, sort of half-heartedly said, yes, that's the way we have to do it. 100%. He didn't quite say, I'm with you. <laughs> but then, the pastor of the church where I was teaching at the time said, well, you fellows must realize Mr. Roberts is involved in our church. A lot of our people know him. And of course the staff knows him. And uh, before coming to the meeting I sat down with our staff and uh, told them that we were, that I was coming here and that Mr. Roberts was behind uh, the invitation. And we were discussing this question. Does Wheaton, Illinois need a revival? Or are we in the midst of the greatest revival in our history? And he said, it's our conclusion, and we know we're right. We are in the midst of the greatest revival this community has ever known. Why, he said, all of you are in the same position that I am. Not one of us is in a church that has a single Sunday morning service. We all have at least two. Some of us have at least three. He said one of the reasons why Mr. Roberts is so well known in our church is that we have two Sunday school sessions and every Sunday he's in town, he's teaching in two sessions and some of his classes are larger than most of the churches in the region. He said, we've got so many people and so much interest in the activities of the church, I submit that it's foolish to have a prayer meeting for revival when we've already got a great revival going on. And with a very crushed spirit, I excused myself and left. I heard nothing at all until on the street I met one of these pastors. Oh, he said, by the way, did you ever hear the outcome of our meeting? No, I said, no one ever shared anything. Well, he said, after you had left, we talked it over among ourselves and said, well, the least we could do would be to meet together ourselves for a weekly prayer meeting. And he said, the first week we met in my study, the second in Pastor So-and-So's study, the third we went to your church, to your pastor's study, and he himself wasn't there. And so he gave up. Now why? Why did it fail? Or was I simply a fool in thinking that it was needed? And that what I suggested to them was indeed right. And when the first pastor picked it up and said, I believe God put this on Mr. Robert's heart. He was as foolish as me. Is that the case? No. 
No, the simple case is most men in ministry don't know there's anything wrong. They don't. Believe me, no pastor would cancel a prayer meeting of his church if he knew something was wrong. Oh, you say, he surely must know something. Yeah, he knows something is wrong, but the problem is you. The problem is always the other guy. And for most pastors, the problem is the world. The educational system, the rotten politicians, the media. But I tried to say to you this morning that something that's wrong is with the people of God. Did you ever find a single passage in Scripture that in detail made it clear that the judgments of God were against the unrighteous? When we speak of these remedial judgments, we're not talking about things that God does to the unbelieving world. Oh, the unbelieving world is affected, of course but their judgments against the people of God. Now what I'm hoping you will really understand tonight is the relationship between the four parts of the passage which I have described to you already. Every true new beginning, every gracious work of God begins with an understanding something is wrong and with an understanding of where the wrong really lies. And even for a multitude who admit something is wrong, they haven't yet admitted that the problem lies in themselves and in their church. And many of you come from churches that have yet to admit that the problem in America is your church and 10,000 other churches just like yours. The second point, which is our theme tonight when I eventually reach it, <laughs> is something must be done. But how can you possibly do what needs to be done when you don't even know anything is wrong? There is a natural order to the points of this passage. It's got to start with an understanding. Something is wrong. Something is wrong in me. Something is wrong in my church. Something is wrong in the whole church. So when you reach the section dealing with with something must be done. It's not something you're going to try to do for others. It's not some cleanup that's necessary in them. It's some cleanup that's necessary in us and in the things that our dirty hands have soiled and brought ruination to. But as I've been saying, I've given you four matters that we're going to dwell upon out of the passage. Something is wrong. Something must be done. Something must happen. Now maybe you've caught the drift already. There are things that we must do. And thank God, things we can do. But there are things that need doing that we can't do. Indeed, the major things that are needed, only God himself can do. But it's absurd to think that God is going to do only what he can when we have refused to do what we must. 
I think rather unwisely, a book that appeared late in the 19th century was entitled The Laws of Revival by a dear and a godly man by the name of James Burns. The book is an excellent book, but the title is quite misleading. If revival is God, which it most certainly is, how can you have the laws that govern God? God is God, obviously, he does what he pleases. And he's not short on imagination. He has an incredible ability in variety. You can't draw the laws of revival because there are no two revivals that are identical. But there are certain basic matters that are crystal clear. Every great act of God is preceded by some degree of understanding that something is wrong. And every great revival is preceded to some degree by something being done. Once in one of the conferences that Henry sponsored years ago at Glorietta and graciously invited me to share in the speaking at that time, I felt profoundly moved to speak upon Second Chronicles 7.14 and used my portion of that wonderful conference to repeat in as careful detail as I could if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves. But really, for the typical congregation, there's no point in going on. Because there's one thing virtually guaranteed in our day, and especially among Southern Baptists. We will not humble ourselves. And there's no point in talking about praying and seeking God's face and turning from our wicked ways if we can't get down in brokenness and contrition before the Lord in humility. But the text is right along the lines of my theme this weekend. If my people called by my name will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways, something must be done. And those are for some things that must be done. Now, I've heard preachers say, we've done those four things, now God is under obligation. Well, now that sounds to me like they left the first one out. <laughs> How does anyone dare say, I have humbled myself? You might say you've been very conscious of the need. And a lot of things that you once took pride in, you feel shame concerning now. But just about the time you're ready to announce to your world that you've humbled yourself, the Lord himself, if you're even slightly serious, will give you overwhelming evidence that there are still some major areas left untouched. But nonetheless, if one could make up laws, I've already said you can't, but if you could, you would surely know that at least these four things must occur. But now, let me give you the outline again. I want this to be so crystal clear to you. First, something is wrong. Then, something must be done. 
And when we have done all we know to do, we can at least hope that the Lord God himself will make something happen. Something that only he can do. So, something so perfectly wonderful that uh, we will be able to instruct the people. Now, tell what God has done to your children and to your grandchildren and teach them to tell their children and grandchildren so every subsequent generation will know when something happened, it was God. But observing the outline of this passage, when I've come to the conviction that something must be done, and it is a conviction that has come upon me with feeling, it's a motivating, empowering conviction, and I not only feel that something must be done, I do all that God brings to my mind to do, and then He, in His grace and His mercy, enters in, and something happens. Then you find there are things that need to change. Things that we must yet do. An unrevived people have a limited understanding of what must be done. But no matter how limited the understanding is, they've got to act faithfully upon what they know. But when revival comes, then indeed it becomes much clearer what must be done. Well, there, you see, is what we're talking about in my portion this weekend. Those four points. Now I think it's time for me to come back to my Bible and to, to lay out in front of you uh, this second issue Something must be done. I had a call earlier in the week from a dear, dear man. And he said, could I have an hour of your time today? Yes, I said, I, I, I have time. We're having lunch now. But if you could come shortly after lunch, I would be more than glad to see you. So when this dear man came, he said, uh, Mr. Roberts, would you be willing to help me in the matter of spiritual leadership? He said, I don't think that I've been very good in leading my congregation. And uh, I would be ever so grateful if you could give me some help in this. And the help that I sought to give him, I think, fits immediately our theme tonight. I said to him, why brother, there are men who try to drive congregations with a whip, who issue orders and expect people to jump, but there are other men who draw so near to God personally that every true believer in their church says to themselves, I better follow my pastor because he is obviously following the Lord. I said my understanding of leadership is that you become such a glorious example of true Christianity that everyone with a heart for God wants to follow in your footsteps and will live almost with an anxiety to catch up with you. But when your heart is right, you'll always be out front leading them. That is why I said to you this morning, you, you might have said to yourself somewhere along the line this morning, I know something's wrong. But the issue that I'm raising is, have you known it to such an extent that 
It has made you a leader among others in this desperately needed area. The thing that breaks my heart is there appear to be so very few people who are leading in this area. I trust Henry Blackaby will pardon my using him as an illustration at this point, but a number of years ago we were doing something uh, in Atlanta and he graciously, I should say he was doing something and he graciously invited me uh, to join him. And in the course of what we were doing together, he, he mentioned to me that he was drawing together a group of leaders uh, to try and set a pace and a pattern for revival. And then he quickly explained, this is Southern Baptist, I don't want you to feel hurt, I'm not inviting you. Uh, well, I said, what concerns me, Henry, is what means are you using to discern who to invite to this special gathering? And this is what he said to me. I have determined to invite only men who, if given an opportunity to speak on any subject, will invariably speak upon revival and our great need of God. Now believe me, if you want to draw together a group of Southern Baptist leaders, and you use that as the criterion, you're not going to need to rent a very large auditorium. <laughs> but you would have to have a larger auditorium if you're a Southern Baptist than any other denomination. Now that's not a very strong compliment, is it? But isn't it a tragedy that a denomination that has so little burden for revival as Southern Baptist has a greater burden than anybody else? What a sick day that we live in. I'm talking about such a sense that something is wrong, that it puts you right out in front. I believe that there isn't a person in this room but what could be thrust into a position of leadership in this whole area if we really follow through with a deep heartfelt burden something must be done but I return to the podium a moment ago saying we were going to take up our text and fail <laughs> but thankfully it's not too late And we can do it now. But I'm not going to. <laughs> because there's something else I need to say before we take up the text. It's a summary of what I've said thus far. When something is wrong, every believer should know it. Obviously they don't. And I suppose that in some instances those who don't know it aren't really believers. But I believe it is possible to be a genuine believer, a truly regenerate person and be blind to great issues. I hope and pray that not one of us will leave this weekend retreat without a deep felt sense that something is wrong. But I think it has to go beyond that. Something is wrong and I should feel it. Something is wrong and you should feel it. But... I should feel it not merely as a man, but I ought to feel it from God's perspective. Surely, one of the purposes of God's holy inspired word of his self-revelation 
is that we might begin to share his heart. And I'm urging you not to be content merely with saying something is wrong and I feel it, but set your heart on feeling it the way God feels it. Did you ever try to so commit yourself to God and his heart that your desire was to hurt when he hurts? To be ashamed and grieved over the things that grieve him. To enter into his passion. To identify to, with him to the fullest degree that he makes possible. So feel it, yes. But feel it the way our Father in heaven feels it. And not merely the shame and the sorrow, but the burning indignation against it. God is filled with loathing against sin. And I'm not suggesting in a blanket fashion you begin to loathe sinners. Loathe them as God does with a heart of compassion with a longing for their repentance, with indeed a compelling sense of goodness that draws them to his heart through you. But feel it as God feels it and hate the evil of it to whatever degree God will enable you to hate it as he hates it. But do it all. Feel it all. Sense it all. With a determination that things are going to change. I believe in a simple way I can tell you what's wrong with the American church. We admit things are not as they ought to be but that's all right. We can live with it. It would be nice if things were different. But they aren't. So I'll fit in. But God isn't fitting in. God isn't accepting what is wrong. He's exercising his loving kindness. God knows that something must be done. And I've got to know it as he knows it. And I've got to set my heart on it. Now, the text. I told you that uh, we're dealing tonight with chapter 29. Hezekiah became king. I mentioned this this morning when he was 25 years old. He reigned for 29 years in Jerusalem. His mother's name, Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father had done. Don't just skip over that expression. That is a definition of what it means to do right. He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. If you don't know what it means to do right in the sight of the Lord, then let David serve as your example, your instructor. You say, why David? Think of his terrible sins. Yes. He was a wretched sinner. Like you are. And like I am. But he had a heart for God. And no matter how deeply he fell into iniquity. 
when the finger of the prophet was pointed his way. He knew where the guilt lay. I mentioned this morning when they were bringing the ark from Philistine territory and the poor farm boy was struck dead. Surely you know that when that happened, David went back to the word of God and came to realize that the farm boy died in his place. And he said to the other leaders and the Levites, we did not do things according to God's law. He took the blame upon himself. He acknowledged his grievous error. His was an error of enthusiasm. Enthusiasm without consultation with the oracles of God. And many a grievous error in our day is done by somebody who is said to have a good heart, but a gross misunderstanding of the revealed will of God. We've got to find what it is that God wants done and how it is God wants it done. David had the grace to do that. This is the end of the first part of this program. To continue, please proceed to disc two. So the critical issue is not are you perfect? Not have you always done everything right? But when you've done wrong, do you then make things right in the same spirit that David made things right? Are you truly a man or a woman after God's heart? He did right in the sight of the Lord according to all that his father David had done. In the first year of his reign, in the first month. Now I've talked with pastors who said to me, I, I, I see this assortment of problems in my church. And believe me, we're going to deal with them. But not right away. I, I want the people to get used to me. I, I want them uh, to learn to love me. I, I want them to feel responsive to my leadership. And then we'll introduce the changes that are needed. Well, about that time, they're out the back door. Or their own heart is so severely compromised that they don't do anything about the evils that they once said they were going to deal with. In the first year, in the first month, Hezekiah went right at the problem. The very first thing that it mentions that he did, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them. Now, if you follow through the passage, it's crystal clear. He had to get the doors repaired. He had to get them opened because in a moment we'll see that he gathered the Levites and ordered them to go in and have a look at the condition of the temple. Well, if the doors couldn't even be opened, they were in such disrepair, the Levites couldn't have followed through on that direction. So the very first thing done mentioned in the passage is the doors of the temple are opened and repaired. Then verse 4. He brought in the priests and the Levites and he gathered them into the square on the east. Then he said to them, Listen to me, O Levites, 
Some of these Levites were as ancient as Don Miller, I dare say. <laughs> and what's a 24, 25 year old kid doing? Giving them orders. Oh, well, he was king, you say. In your estimate, is king more important in the ways of God than pastor? I wouldn't think that for a moment. I believe the highest honor that God can elevate a mere man to is that of pastor over his own flock. I think a lot of pastors cheapen their position. They bring it down and make it look as if it's nothing. And then they're surprised when the congregation treats them with contempt. If a man doesn't have a high sense of his calling, he's not going to be very effectual in fulfilling that calling. King, Ace, uh, King Hezekiah had the courage to draw young and old of the Levites together and to issue orders. Listen to me, O Levite. Consecrate yourself. Now everything that follows would be sheer nonsense if they didn't begin at that point. The biggest problem in the church in America is men and women in Christian service who have not consecrated themselves. Who are not Holy, who neither have holy thoughts nor holy actions. They have been defiled by the sins of their own body. And every true effort to bring about change begins with that simple order. Consecrate yourself. It would be absurd for me to rush on through this passage and to uh, bring to your attention the various things that were done having passed over this vital issue of consecration. Oh, you say, I, I am an ordained minister and I consecrated myself at the time of my ordination. Well, that's nice. But I don't think that carries any weight with God. It's what I am today that matters. I am an ordained minister. I was ordained before many of you were even born. But it never occurred to me that that was going to endure for a lifetime. There have been many times when re-consecration was necessary. And the re-consecration oftentimes has been more serious and more urgently needed than the initial consecration. Then an awful lot of soil that has had to be dealt with. So I pause and I ask each of you, if you're ready to acknowledge that something must be done, are you ready to start here with consecrating yourself? Well, you say, really, is nothing major wrong in my life. Well, I should hope not. But it isn't the major wrongs that are our undoing normally. It's the small defilements. The little things that we become tolerant of. The things perhaps that nobody else has even noticed about us. But the things that are so bold in the eyes of God that he could not possibly cause something to happen in and through you 
until you had taken seriously this demand. Consecrate yourselves now. Not after you go home. Not even at the close of the Cedars Conference. Consecrate yourselves now. And again, the order of the passage is so perfectly right. When you've consecrated yourselves, then consecrate the house of the Lord, the God of your Father. And then he gets quite specific. Verse 5 again. Carry the uncleanness out from the holy place. For our fathers have been unfaithful. These words we read this morning. They have done evil in the sight of the Lord our God. They have forsaken him and turned their faces away from the dwelling place of the Lord. And have turned their backs. They have also shut the door of the porch. And put out the lamps. And have not burned incense. Or offered burnt offerings in the holy place to the God of Israel. Now what an astonishing array of evil. Imagine having closed the doors of the temple, having turned off the lights, having ceased all the sacrifices. They didn't know the day was coming when the final sacrifice would be made. They had no grounds on which to cut off the sacrifices. They were in gross disobedience. wasn't enough to consecrate themselves because the temple of the Lord had been defiled they had to clean up the place of worship they had to consecrate it as thoroughly as they were required to consecrate themselves we read this morning in verses 8 and 9. Therefore the wrath of the Lord was against Judah and Jerusalem. And he has made them an object of terror, of horror, and of hissing. As you see with your own eyes. For behold, our fathers have fallen by the sword, and our sons and our daughters and our wives are in captivity. And we read this morning that that 120 were slaughtered, and 200,000 men, women, and children carried away into captivity. There's a price to be paid. When we fail to maintain our consecration and the consecration of God's house. So, obviously, the first issue in the passage is Hezekiah knew something was wrong. And he knew something must be done. He saw and he felt the problem. And some of you will go home seeing the problem and feeling the problem. But it won't take three days to realize afresh that there are not going to be a multitude joining you. And your tendency is going to be to cool off and to say, well, there's nothing I can do. And I don't believe that's true. I said already, I don't think there's a single individual here but who can move so far out in front with God that others in your world, however large or small it may seem, 
will say, I like where I see her, and I'm going to join her. I've said to you already that my understanding of spiritual leadership is that you get out in front by being the person God has called you to be and maintaining that position by his grace and for his glory. Not because you have a lust for power, not because you long to have a following, but because you long to be so close to Christ that others are inspired by the success that God grants you and they join you in your movement toward him. The happy thing about this passage is that it wasn't just the king that felt these things. It was the king who led them. Look at verses 10 and 11 of chapter 29. Now it is in my heart to make a covenant with the Lord God of Israel that his burning anger may turn away from us my sons, let me pause and ask you to remember again how old this lad is who is saying, my son. That isn't suggesting that all this happened years later. No, no, we've been plainly told this happened in the first year of his reign and in the first month and that he was 25 years of age. What that tells us is he knew who he was. And knowing who he was, he said, My son, do not be negligent now, for the Lord has chosen you to stand before him to minister to him and to be his ministers and burn incense. And he heard no cat call. And he heard no hissing. Those, these people were famous for that sort of thing. Instead, we readily discover that what the king felt and called for, the Levites quickly identified with and joined him in this determination to do what must be done. We read in verse 12, the Levites arose. I long for the day when it's my joy to address a congregation and immediately they stand to their feet and say, we're going to do it and we're going to do it now. The most common response is, oh, that was interesting. I'll think about that. Thank God that was not the response of the Levites. They arose. Something must be done became the burden of their hearts. Look at verse 15. First off, they assembled their brothers. Second, they consecrated themselves just as the king commanded. Third, they went in to cleanse the house of the Lord according to the commandment of the king, by the words of the Lord. Fourth, the priest went in to the inner part of the house of the Lord, verse 16, to cleanse it, and every unclean thing which they found in the temple of the Lord they brought out to the court of the house of the Lord. 
And then we read, the Levites received it and carried it out to the Kidron Valley. Have you ever purposefully moved around your church facilities with the determination to take out of the church every unclean thing? And every unclean person? Just let your mind dwell on that. What would it mean? Think of this from a personal perspective. What would it mean to consecrate your place of worship? If you were to remove every unclean thing, what, you, what would you be carrying out? If you were to remove every unclean person, who would have to go? Well, in most cases, at least some of the deacons. And in a lot of cases, at least one of the pastoral staff. And uh, in a lot of instances, a goodly percentage of the members would have to be removed. Well, you say, we can't do that. You can't. God, in other words, made commandments that cannot be obeyed. He wasn't really serious about this. Do you think these Levites went in and carried every unclean thing out and they were applauded by the multitudes who had assisted in bringing all that corruption into the place of worship? Why, that doesn't make any sense at all. It all got there. You couldn't possibly conclude that when Ahaz died, all the people who had joined in the contamination died with him. This isn't after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness when finally the last of those reprobates is dead. No, many of those who participated in the defilement of the house of God, were still on the scene and had carried into the house of God the unclean things themselves. But if we're going to get serious in response to the statement, something must be done, we may very well offend a multitude. But surely part of the feeling that must accompany the knowledge that something is wrong is the conviction that it is better to have men angry with me than God. Now I don't believe God called me here tonight to tell you precisely what must be done in your situation. That's in no way necessary. There could be no wisdom in my even trying to do so. But the king helped the Levites to understand that it was their responsibility to begin this work by consecrating themselves and the house of God. It's enough for me to say that to you. You want to see a change? You long for God to do what only God can do? Then you're going to have to do what he commands. You're going to have to clean up the house of God. He's going to have to show you how. He's going to have to be with you. But I believe when the people of God consecrate themselves, God will aid them greatly in the cleansing that is demanded. I think our real problem is we're comfortable with the way things are. 
be awfully nice if they were better, but it's not so bad, but what I can stand it. And if you follow the line of most professed Christians today, you do have an escape mechanism. You can pray that the rapture will come and you'll be carried off and you won't have to see it all. But there's something terribly ungodly about asking God to remove you from this mess when your children and your grandchildren are already corrupted by it. Anybody who would be content to go off to heaven and leave everyone they supposedly love to go to hell has a very contemptible form of Christianity. I believe every true saint will live in readiness for the return of our Lord. But there are an awful lot of things I hope will happen before he comes. I'd like to see the church across our land and around the world consecrated. But I want to ask you now, will you go away from this weekend with a heartfelt determination to consecrate yourself and the church where God has placed you? Now, we read in verse 17 that they began their work of consecration on the first day of the first month. Then on the eighth day of the month, they entered the porch of the Lord. You see, we were already told that they began in the inner sanctuary. Took them seven days to clean up the inner portion. Then we're told it took them until the 16th of the month to get the rest of the area around the temple and the outer porch cleaned up. Now, I don't think those were 16 easy days. But I think they were 16 days of joy and rejoicing. There's always something very joyous when you know that after a long season of decline, things are turned around and you're on your way back to a right relationship with God and that by his grace, you're not going on this journey alone, but because you have consecrated not only yourself, But the church, God himself is with you. And wonderful things are going to happen. Isn't it glorious to know when we have done what we must, he will do what he only can do. First, something is wrong. Second, something is wrong must be done. And third, something must happen. Oh God. Oh God, that we might live to see with our own eyes you doing what only you can do. But how could we even for a moment realistically hope that you will come among us in mighty power when we are slovenly contemptuous of your law and willing even to bow in supposed worship in a place defiled by sin. Oh, help us, God, to do what we must. But when the Levites had done their part, we read in verse 18 that the Levites reported to King Hezekiah and they said to him, we have cleansed the whole house of the Lord. 
the altar of burnt offering with all of its utensils, the table of showbread with all of its utensils, moreover all the utensils which King Ahaz had desecrated during his reign in his unfaithfulness, We have prepared and consecrated, and behold, they are before the altar of the Lord. Hezekiah did what he must. The Levites did what they must. But notice what happens next. Verse 20, King Hezekiah arose early. And he assembled the princes of the city and went up to the house of the Lord. And he made it quite clear to the princes of the city that there were three great matters that it was up to them to care for. Verses 21 to 24, a sin offering was required. Verses 25 to 28, a burnt offering was necessary. Verses 29 to 30, a thank offering and worship were indeed in order. So the princes of the city caught the vision caught the burden, became aware not only was something wrong, but something must be done. And look at how they participated in the fulfillment of their part of the requirement. They brought seven bulls, seven rams, seven lambs, seven male goats, And notice what they brought them for. Number one, for the kingdom. Number two, for the sanctuary. Number three, for Judah. And when they understood that a burnt offering was needed, it came with musical instruments, cymbals, harps, lyres, trumpets, And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord also began with the trumpets accompanied by the instruments of David, king of Israel. And while the whole assembly worshipped, verse 28, the singers also sang and the trumpets sounded and all this continued until the burnt offering was finished. And then, at the completion of the burnt offering, verse 29, the king and all those who were present with him bowed down and worshipped. Moreover, King Hezekiah and all the officials ordered the Levites to sing praises to the Lord with the words of David and Asaph, the seer, so they sang praises with joy and bowed down and worshipped. The American church is not notorious for its joy. So we have to have comedians like we had last night to entertain us. But When lives are consecrated and the house of God is consecrated and God's order of worship is reintroduced and done God's way to the pleasure of God's heart, a spirit of joy and rejoicing comes to the people of God. That's why we've had cited at least twice in this conference Revive us again that thy people may rejoice in you. So Hezekiah 
then the Levites, then the princes. Now it's time for the people. The people know that something must be done. Verses 31 to 36. Now that you have consecrated yourselves to the Lord, come near and bring sacrifices and thank offerings to the house of the Lord. So for burnt offerings, they brought 70 bulls, 100 rams, 200 lambs, and consecrated things, 600 bulls, and 3,000 sheep. Did you ever stop to ask how many priests would it take to deal with all of that? And they did have a problem because not all the priests up until that point had consecrated themselves. But you see, when the leadership got right with God, the people were ready for a change. You'll never drive a congregation to repentance, but you can lead it. And when you've gone the full distance that God has required you to go, you can look back and discover a whole multitude rushing to keep up. Oh, brothers and sisters, you say that's a wonderful thing. I hope the pastors get a hold of that. <laughs> don't put it off on them. I don't believe you're here by accident. I honestly believe in the sovereignty of God. I really believe he's brought us together so that each of us can consecrate ourselves and everything that our hands have been given to do. And we can, by the grace of God, get out in front and watch God bring others along with us. And it doesn't matter whether you're male or female, whether you're young or old, whether you're wise or otherwise. What matters is purely and simply obedience to the Lord. So we read Hezekiah, and all the people rejoiced. You see, the earlier comment about the rejoicing had to do with the princes and those that were gathered with them. But now all the people rejoiced over what God had prepared for the people because, now, now, now listen to this. Are, are you paying attention? Are you aware of where we're at in this passage? Look at verse 36, chapter 29. Then Hezekiah... And all the people rejoiced over what God had prepared for the people because the thing came about suddenly. Some of you have heard me say this before. I, I hope on my deathbed, if revival hasn't come by then, my closing words will be, suddenly, the Lord came. There are three precious things we need to focus on in this last verse of 29. Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced. I've emphasized it already, but it must be emphasized again. Revive us again, that thy people may rejoice in you. I think our world is dying for a vision of rejoicing Christians. They don't believe in our God because they don't believe in us. They don't see that we have anything exceptional. They're not convinced that when we sing happy, happy, happy and I, 
that we mean anything significant by it. But when God does what he alone can do, rejoicing comes. And it's a level of rejoicing not otherwise known. I can speak as one who has seen huge revivals, but I can speak of one who was brought very low in his own personal life and whom God most graciously revived. And I could not even begin to sufficiently describe the joy that was mine and still is. And I have been in a few places where an extraordinary touch of the Spirit of God came. And it's been so sweet to see the faces light up with joy. So we have, as I said, three things. Joy. But I don't want you to pass over lightly these words. Words telling us what they were rejoicing over. Verse 36, they were rejoicing over what God had prepared for the people. Oft times, someone having asked, Mr. Roberts, how long have you been doing this? We'll say, don't you get discouraged? The only thing that could discourage me would be my own failure to do what I was called to do. I wasn't, I wasn't called to revive the church. If I had been called to do it, I couldn't do it. I've only been called to urge the church to recognize something must be done having first understood and felt deeply something is wrong. And I believe whenever a people begin to feel deeply that something is wrong and begin to inaugurate those changes that are appropriate, it's because God has prepared something for his people that is going to bring a genuine season of rejoicing. But as I've tried to say already, I also love the last word of the verse. Because the thing came about suddenly. I think some of the brief testimonies we've heard this weekend could very well have focused on the word suddenly. Don told us about prayers prayed for a long time. Henry told us about praying uh, for the Native Americans for a long time. And suddenly, I don't know that he used the word, but to, if he were standing by my side, I think he'd put his arm around me and say, you're right, brother, suddenly. It doesn't matter how black it looks at the moment. How little reason we have humanly to be encouraged. I had to report to the men in my prayer meeting on Friday morning that in recent days I had allowed myself to focus more on the problem than upon the problem solver. And I was recommitting myself to keep my eyes fixed on the one who comes suddenly. <laughs> With an already prepared plan for his people. Well, that might be a good time to end. But it would be unfaithful if I did. <laughs> because this matter continues. Look at verse 1 of chapter 30. Hezekiah, we read, 
sent to all Israel and Judah. He wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh, that they should come to the house of the Lord at Jerusalem to celebrate the Passover to the Lord God of Israel, for the king and his princes and all the assembly in Jerusalem had decided to celebrate the Passover in the second month since they could not celebrate it at that time because the priest had not consecrated themselves in sufficient numbers, nor had the people been gathered to Jerusalem. Thus the thing was right in the sight of the king and of all the assembly. So they established a decree to circulate a proclamation throughout all Israel from Beersheba even to Dan that they should come to celebrate the Passover to the Lord God of Israel at Jerusalem for they had not celebrated it in great numbers as was prescribed and the couriers went through all Israel and Judah with the letter from the hand of the king and his princes, even according to the command of the king, saying, O sons of Israel, return to the Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, that he may return to those of you who are escaped and are left from the hand of the king of Assyria, and do not be like your fathers and your brothers who are unfaithful to the Lord God of their fathers, so that he made them a horror as you see. And would it be out of the way for me to say, pick up your ears now and notice these next words. Now do not Harden your neck like your father's. Maybe some of us personally need to hear and heed those words. Enter his sanctuary, which he has consecrated forever, and serve the Lord your God, that his burning anger may turn away from you. For if you return to the Lord, your brothers and your sons will find compassion before those who led them captive and will return to this land. For the Lord your God is gracious and compassionate And he will not turn his face away from you if you return to him. Do some of you remember that word spoken in Asa's day? The land is still yours because you sought the Lord. And he allowed you to find him. Oh, what a word that is for America. Who lost America for the kingdom of God? It wasn't them. It was us. We ceased to seek the Lord. I've had preachers say to me, We don't need to seek the Lord. He isn't lost. And yet time after time, he has commanded us to seek his faith. And he has graciously promised us, if you will return to me, I will return to you. If you will seek me with all of your heart, 
I will let you find me. So we have Hezekiah acknowledging something must be done. We have the princes acknowledging something must be done. We have the Levites acknowledging something must be done. We have the people of Jerusalem acknowledging something must be done. And then we have the call throughout the land, come to Jerusalem and celebrate with us the Passover. We don't know whether the call included the information, the temple has been reconsecrated and the multitude of priests are ready. But we do know the invitation was given. We know that some mocked and treated the couriers with contempt. But we also know a multitude of the people came and they met God at the Passover in Jerusalem. And everyone here tonight surely knows something must be done. And we most certainly know that we've got to consecrate ourselves. And we've got to reconsecrate the house of the Lord. But before we can consecrate it, we've got to clean it up. And I want to ask you if you will not go before the Lord tonight and ask him what kind of cleansing your life requires and your church requires. A covenant was called for. A covenant with the Lord God. And their key words in the covenant return. Humble yourself. Consecrate. Purify. Remove. Prepare your hearts to seek. What are you going to do? Go out saying thank you to the preacher for having given, given an interesting sermon? Well, not everybody even thought it was that good. But I don't much care what you say to me. But an awful lot hangs on what you say to the Lord. We can look at this passage with rejoicing and say, as I said a moment ago, the king did his part, the princes did their part, the Levites did their part, the people of Jerusalem did their part, the people of the land did their part. But what about us? Well, Lord, That's where it all hangs. What about us? There are many here who feel very insignificant. And their basic question may well be, what can I do? I'm not anybody. But I thank you tonight that there is not a single nobody in the kingdom of God. Everybody is somebody in your heart. We know that you have called us into the kingdom for these very days. I pray that you will so work in our hearts that we 
in utter faithfulness to you, we'll do everything that you've called upon us to do and do it in such a way that even before something happens, the rejoicing will start. The confidence will be ours that you have prepared something wonderful for the people of God and through them for a lost and dying world. Our prayer is lifted in the name of our great Savior and Lord, Jesus Christ. Amen. And may I suggest to you that it would be terribly wise to remain where you are and to be sure that you're going to do what the Lord wants you to do. If you refuse, you might as well leave now. But if you're willing, why not tarry until it is crystal clear to you what you are to do next? I can't do it for you. I have business to care for before God myself. Let us all be faithful. Over the past several months, the phrase, people need the Lord, has come to me repeatedly, often during the night, frequently the first thing in my mind in the morning, people need the Lord. And isn't it obvious that when we think that and say that, we're not talking about some people, but all people everywhere need the Lord. And sometimes it makes you ashamed and sometimes even confused that there are so few who know the Lord, and who f so few even who are confronted with the glorious gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. I haven't any recent statistics concerning the city of Chicago, but some time ago, some concerned men tried to make a study of the situation in the city and it's not a large city by some standards, well, only three and a half million people, but it was estimated that of that three and a half million people, there were less than 90,000 that had any relationship whatsoever with an evangelical church. Suppose, just for easy speech, we said 100,000 out of 3 million. And despite all the religious enterprises in the Chicago area, the bulk of that 3,400,000 people have never heard a true presentation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Back in the early part of the 1800s, a pastor in the city of Philadelphia by the name of Albert Barnes, some of you may be familiar with Barnes' notes. He wrote a series of commentaries on the Bible, which lay people in particular have found very, very useful, but he wrote a book with the title, The Theory and the Desirability of Revivals. 
And the thesis of his book was, there is only one way to reach the masses of people with the gospel. And he went on to demonstrate that in the great metropolitan areas, and of course in the 1820s, they weren't a fraction of the size that they are now, nor was there a fraction of the difficulty of reaching people then as there is now. But his theory was simply this. People in large metropolitan areas are moved by excitement. Now, living in the Chicago region for near 30 years, it's quite clear to us that the city moves from one excitement to another. The people go almost crazy over a football match. You couldn't possibly live anywhere in the region without being aware of what was going on. People get all worked up and excited over some political matter or over an election. And his theory, when he said the theory and the desirability of revivals, his theory was that it is only a genuine revival of religion that creates the atmosphere of excitement that captures the attention of the masses of the people. I first read that book as a youth, and I thought he was right. And I'm more convinced tonight than ever that a revival of true religion is the only way we are going to see the need that people have of the Lord met. And I'd like that to be a part of your thinking tonight as we return to the Second Chronicles passage. People need the Lord. And in the holy atmosphere of excitement, in a genuine revival, the hearts of the people and their eyes are turned in the direction of Jesus Christ. And can you think of any other way? Well, we've tried a thousand different methods and we haven't yet scratched the surface. And as I said already this weekend, part of our difficulty is that we have men with such imaginations and such innovative spirits that they're not cast up yet upon the Lord because they have one more notion of what might work. That we'd be a whole lot smarter, all of us, to admit tonight and then to tell the world that the only answer of the need of the people for the Lord is a spiritual awakening brought by the Holy Ghost that results in every eye focused on our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. They won't give him even a thoughtful look until something happens in the church that creates an awareness that God is alive and at work and has the power to save from sin. Who in their right mind would believe that Christ has the power to save from sin if they studied the life of the average professing Christian? There's overwhelming evidence that the gospel doesn't work if you look at typical Christians. But one of the beauties of a season of true revival is that false religion takes wings and disappears. And men and women who have been stumbling and falling repeatedly throughout their years of professed Christianity are suddenly brought face to face with the power of God. And they find that indeed our Lord Jesus Christ, when he died and was buried, 
and raised from the dead and ascended back to heaven, not only purchased our justification, but he purchased our sanctification and our glorification and that there is power in the Lord Jesus Christ to save us from our sins. And believe me, when hundreds of thousands of Christians suddenly wake up to the reality of the power of Jesus Christ and find themselves literally transformed by the gospel of Christ, the world will set up and take notice. I can't imagine anything more exciting than the Spirit of God rescuing all at once thousands and tens of thousands and hundreds of thousands of Christians from their mediocrity and turning them into walking saints. I'm not sure that most of us have an adequate appreciation yet of the significance of revival, indeed of its theory and desirability. I've been reminded that I haven't said a word about books. And before I start to speak, if you keep a stopwatch, don't count what's been said thus far because that was not the sermon. <laughs> and surely don't count the next moment or two. But in the men's gathering this afternoon, something was said about the corporate repentance and the little booklet, the solemn assembly, was mentioned, and uh, Skip wanted me to remind you that we have a book called Sanctify the Congregation. And this little pamphlet is in the book, along with a host of other things. And I would encourage uh, those of you who are willing to give consideration to the need of corporate repentance to indeed secure uh, this or borrow it. We're not so keen on selling things that... Uh, we're making a pitch from that standpoint, but we are concerned that indeed we take seriously the call of God in this regard. I also wanted to urge you to be totally committed to a prayer meeting at least once a week that has its entire focus on revival. If you're not already doing so, I plead with you to do so. You, if you say, well, I don't know of any prayer meeting like that that I could go to. Well, start one. You say, I, I could start one, but I don't know of anybody who would join me. Well, the Lord will. And that's a good place to start. But if you're all alone, begin to pray. Lord, will you give me a partner to pray with where we can pour out our hearts to you for revival? And because of my conviction of the urgent need of prayer, we have put together and published a considerable number of books on the subject of revival. And uh, if you haven't seen this book, I heartily recommend it to you. Scotland saw his glory. I think the title is magnificent. May I step down and whisper to these women here, do you know what the very essence of revival is? The glory of God. When God draws near and reveals his glory to his people, and when there is a season of revival, as there was often in Scotland, it can be said, glory filled the land. And we produce these books and keep them in print, even though we're unable to sell any large quantity, because I find that one way to keep a revival prayer meeting on track is to read an account of revival 
at the beginning of the prayer meeting. And so we have purposefully put together literature to help people to do that. Now, Margaret's going to come and collect these and get them out of my way so that I'm not tempted to make any further uh, advertisements. And uh, thank you. Oops, sorry. And now we're ready to begin. And if you have your stopwatch and you feel it important, uh, in a moment, punch it, and then uh, you can see whether I violated your notion of an appropriate length of time for a sermon. (laughs) You can tell me about it if you please. But I doubt seriously that it will have any impact. (laughs) I don't see any sign of revival happening. But I see one thing that uh, is very hopeful. In the early years of my ministry, when I hadn't uh, hardly learned to speak at all, and the sermons were seldom more than an hour. I think I was criticized every time I spoke about the length of the sermons. I'm still criticized. And once in a while the sermons go over an hour. And sometimes even approach three hours. But strangely and wonderfully, to me at least, the last criticism of the length of a sermon that I can recall, though I'm probably somewhat deaf to this kind of criticism, (laughs) but the last criticism was about four years ago. But strangely and wonderfully, I've had hundreds of people say to me, why didn't you finish? Why did you stop so soon? And as I say, I don't interpret that as revival, but I do believe that heart hunger is an indication of the prospects of revival drawing near. So I'm grateful for that sign, even though it might not seem all that important to some. Now, some have come this evening, I'm aware, who have not been here on a regular basis, and I want to take a moment to, for their sake of review, but I'd like to start this evening with ever so brief a reading from the Gospel of Luke at chapter 3. The Gospel of Luke at chapter 3. Now, just by way of review, we have been dealing with a passage in Second Chronicles, beginning at chapter 28, verse 1, and running through the end of chapter 32 with a little lap over into chapter 33. We have not gotten that far, but that is the passage that we have under consideration. And as I have informed those who have been present, it appeared to me in preparing my heart and mind for this Cedars Conference that the passage fell into four specific areas. And I have thus entitled my messages, Something is Wrong. And we use principally chapter 28 as a reference to this fact. Then last evening, I addressed you on the subject, Something must be done using principally chapter 30. And as I said, I'm being forced, and appropriately so, to put the last two together. Uh, One always lives in hope that they will have ample time to say everything to be said. But my wife Maggie, as we were coming here this week, said to me, now don't you dare trespass on Henry or Richard's time. And that's a good word. 
and I'm glad she reminded me of that. But when we got here and saw the program, I saw that someone had arranged things so that if there was trespassing, it would be upon your sleep time. <laughs> and in that tomorrow's a holiday, But now, questions have been asked during the day concerning the matter of consecration because the obvious thrust of the passage last evening was consecrate yourselves. And some have asked, what does that mean? And can you give us any direction in that? I share just a little bit with the men this afternoon, and I'll not repeat that. So if you've come with a man, my dear lady, ask your husband about it and see whether he was listening or not. <laughs> but it appeared to me that it would be of immense help if we were to read this passage from Luke 3. And then I think you will have a real insight into what it means to consecrate yourself in the 15th year of the reign of Tiberius Caesar, when Pontius Pilate was governor of Judea, and Herod was tetrarch of Galilee, and his brother Philip was tetrarch of the region of Ituria and Trachonitis, and Lysanias was tetrarch of Abilene, in the high priest of Ananias and Caiaphas. The word of God came to John, the son of Zechariah in the wilderness, and he came into all the district around the Jordan preaching a baptism of repentance for forgiveness of sins, as it is written in the book of the words of Isaiah the prophet, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, make Ready the way of the Lord. Now before we read on, I would not want anyone to suppose that I was saying that we have an identical circumstance with that which John the Baptist faced. For that would not be accurate. But that there is very careful instruction in these words concerning what it means to consecrate ourselves, and the need of this consecration is crystal clear. You know as well as I do that John was the forerunner of our Lord, and that it was his task to prepare the way of the Lord. And when we speak about consecrating ourselves in this conference, we have spoken of, of it in connection with the statement, something must be done. We, in other words, must prepare the way of the Lord. I tried to make it clear yesterday that we are not going to bring about revival. And John made it clear he was not the Christ. He was merely, I say merely, but that's really a poor word to use because his role could hardly be described as merely under any circumstance. But he was preparing the way of the Lord and when I say from the passage in Chronicles something must be done, that's what I'm talking about, preparing the way of the Lord. And the lovely thing about this Luke passage is it gives us a very clear idea of what it means to prepare the way of the Lord. So verse 4 again, make ready the way of the Lord of the Lord, make his paths straight. Every ravine 
shall be filled up, and every mountain and high hill shall be brought low, and the crooked shall become straight, and the rough roads smooth. And, and I love this line, and all flesh shall see the salvation of God. Isn't that what I began with? People need the Lord. How can we ever hope that all people will indeed hear the gospel call, be melted under the terms of grace and glory that are part and parcel of revival? When revival comes, all flesh sees the salvation of God. Now, obviously, if it's a localized revival and a single city is revived, we're talking about all flesh in that city. If it's a statewide revival, we're talking about all flesh in that state. But what we're praying for is much more than a local or a state revival. We are not even limiting our prayers to a national revival. We are pleading with God for a worldwide awakening. And we don't care where it starts. If it starts in your church, wonderful. If it starts in my church, wonderful. If it starts in the church of somebody that's never even heard of Cedars, praise the Lord. All we care about is that the Lord comes and that all flesh sees the glory of the Lord. And our part is so clearly detailed by John's message and John's own labors. Is there anything in your life that could be called a crooked path? (coughs) See that it's made straight. Is there any area in your life that is low, any valley, any hole, any empty space, any place where a road could not effectually be built? Well, fill in the low places, any high places where if the Lord were to come to us, he would have to ascend and come over this high place. Bring the high places down. Are there any big rocks in the way? Any huge trees? Years and years ago, I was living in California, and it was time to make a visit home to my folks in New York, and my sister called one time, She said, I'd love to see California. What if I flew out to California and we drove back to New York together? Oh, I said, that'd be marvelous. So I got the notion that a nice thing to do on the way home was to show her all the sights. So I said, well, we'll go through Yosemite Park and come out on the east side. Now, that probably doesn't mean anything to some of you. But believe me, that was an undertaking. That was anything but a highway of holiness. Every time there was a tree, what might have been called a road, but perhaps was more nearly a cow path, you had to circle around the tree. And whenever there was a big rock, you had to go around that, and sometimes on the cliff side of the rock, on a track so narrow that we went about as slowly as you can drive a vehicle. And along for miles and miles and miles, we were hovering right on the edge of extreme danger. And a lot of people try to live that way. A lot of people have never taken seriously the immense consequence of preparing the way of the Lord. So when I've spoken to you about consecration, we've talked about every mountain and hill 
being brought low and the crooked way becoming straight and the rough roads smooth. So the question with which I begin tonight, is the consecration process complete? Could you honestly stand before the Father in heaven and say, Lord, you know that there is not one thing that remains to be done by way of preparation of the highway of holiness whereby we can anticipate that you are going to journey to us in great revival so that all flesh shall see the glory of the Lord. But I dare not dwell upon former points lest I fail completely in observing your weariness to finish my series. So let us move along then and uh, take that as a brief review of the things that have already been said. I've named four points. Something is wrong. Something must be done. And now this evening, something must happen. You have your Bible ready? We are now again in chapter 29 at verse 36. I read this to you last evening and made some detailed statements concerning it. But let us pick the theme up there at this time and then move forward. Second Chronicles 29, verse 36. Then Hezekiah and all the people rejoiced over what God had prepared for the people because the thing came about suddenly. And I took the time last evening to point out to you that there are three glorious truths relating to revival in that brief sentence. Revival and rejoicing go hand in hand. It is impossible for me to conceive of a revival that does not include rejoicing. In fact, one of the criticisms that has been made over the centuries of revival is that Christians seem to be beside themselves with joy. And one of the reasons why unwise and unsound people denounce revivals is they say a revival of religion is nothing but wild extremism and enthusiasm. Well, if you've been around a wife who has been droopy and sad for 37 years and suddenly she's full of the joy of the Lord, you might think she's gone off her rocker. But if you had any wisdom, you'd be grateful that she was done with that season of drudgery. But revival does mark true Revival. Or, yes, and uh, it doesn't mean that all problems are eliminated and that life is just as uh, smooth and easy and glorious. It means that when there is a real sense of the glory of God, oh, what meaning and consequence is there in a few years of suffering? Things get put into perspective in revival. And one understands in the midst of a revival that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory, not merely the glory which is to be revealed in us, but the glory that is being revealed in us. I have said before that in a season of revival, Heaven comes closer to earth than it 
any other time in human experience. And how could anyone be talking about revival without a sense of the significance of the joy that accompanies being in the felt presence of the Lord of glory. But as I said, three items are drawn to our attention in this final verse of chapter 29. God himself has prepared for the people. So when we're talking about revival, we're not talking about something that I prepared for the people or you prepared for the people or the best man in the nation prepared for the people, but what the Lord himself prepared. And the third concept, so beautiful, which I've so often stressed here at the Cedars, suddenly. And oh, the meaning of that has never dulled for me. The sheer concept that we can go away from a series of meetings where everything seems to be the same as it was. And yet, by the grace of God, a seed might have been sown that suddenly breaks through the crust of earth and appears in the glorious flower of revival. So the subject to revival is first introduced in this beautiful spirit at the end of the 29th chapter. Now, let me outline what I'm about to say so that hopefully you can follow me. What I have just said concerning verse 36 might be summarized by saying something had happened in Judah. And the, the author of the Chronicles reveals it in that 36th verse. Then we think in terms of something must happen in Judah. And I pointed out to you last evening that the fourth part of chapter 30 is dealing with the fact that once Hezekiah was aware that the preparation had been made, that the way of the Lord had been made straight, that the crooked had been straightened out, that the high had been brought low, and the low brought up, and that everything was in preparation. Then we read in verse 1 of chapter 30 that Hezekiah sent to all Israel and Judah and wrote letters also to Ephraim and Manasseh, and uh, they sent out this epistle carried at the hands of couriers. And as I remarked to you last night, some of the couriers, verse 10, passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh and as far as Zebulun, but they laughed them to scorn and they mocked them. Nevertheless, we read in verse 11, some men of Asher, Manasseh, and Zebulun humbled themselves and came to Jerusalem. And the hand of God was also on Judah, to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of the Lord. Now that hasn't happened to us in these United States yet. The Lord has not given us one heart to keep his commandments and in particular, his commandment about making ready the way of the Lord. But wouldn't it be wonderful if one of the outcomes of this Cedars Conference was that everyone in attendance was totally committed to keeping this commandment of ever ready way for the Lord to come to us. 
And I think it would be appropriate now to bow together in prayer and ask that this will really be true. Oh, Father in heaven, people need you. Our wiser forefathers understood that people would never, ever give due attention to our Lord Jesus Christ unless some true and legitimate excitement stirred them up, just as in Jerusalem, in the fore part of Acts. Multitudes were stirred up when Pentecost came and kept stirred up for weeks and months as miracle after miracle occurred and as people group after people group were filled with the Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the pattern both in the Old Covenant Scriptures and in the book of Acts demonstrating how the people had to keep that preparedness constantly so that indeed at any moment you could suddenly come. I plead for my brothers and sisters here tonight that not one of us will relax, but indeed that we will be vigilant throughout all our days to be certain that what we must do not only was done, but is done and is kept in readiness for your coming at all times. Lord, will you so move upon us that there will never be any uncertainty again about being ready for you to come in great power whenever you design to do so. Help us now as we proceed in this text uh, to catch a deeper vision of the glory of the Lord in revival, so that indeed we shall pant after your presence, long for it with a greater longing than has ever gripped us in any other way or for any other thing. I plead, Lord, that in your grace and in your mercy, you will choose to come and show your glory to the people. In Jesus' strong name, we pray. The first time I spoke during this conference, I showed you a little pamphlet that I had brought along and said I was going to read some from it. And I told you that the idea for the second part of the sermon came from this pamphlet entitled, Something Must Be Done. And now I'd like to read a portion to you from this pamphlet. This, as I said yesterday, was written by Gardner Spring, pastor of the Brick Presbyterian Church in New York City. A sermon preached on the last day of the year 1815. We have never seen a general revival of the Christian interest in this city. And most of us would have to say the same. We've never seen a genuine revival in our city. And most of us have never even traveled somewhere else specifically and deliberately or even accidentally and came upon a revival. In two or three of our congregations, there have been some seasons of unusual solemnity which have from time to time resulted in very hopeful accessions to the numbers of God's professing people 
but we have not been visited with any general outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Hence, we talk about revivals of religion without any definite meaning. And hence, many honest minds are prejudiced against them. Some identify them with illusions of a disturbed fancy, while others give them a place among the most objectionable extravagances and the wildest expressions of enthusiasm. But we mean none of these things when we speak of revivals of religion. It is no illusion, no reverie we present to your view, but those plain exhibitions of the power and the grace of God which commend themselves to the reason and the conscience of every impartial mind. The showers of divine grace often begin like other showers, with here and there a drop. The revival in the days of Hezekiah arose from a very small beginning. In the early stages of a work of grace, God is usually pleased to affect the hearts of some of his own people here and there. An individual Christian is aroused from his stupor. The objects of faith begin to predominate over the objects of sense, and his languishing graces to be more lively and constant in exercise. In the progress of the work, the quickening power of grace pervades the church bowed down under a sense of their own stupidity and the impending danger of sinners, the great body of professing Christians are anxious and prayerful. In the meantime, the influences of the Holy Spirit are extended to the world. And the conversion of one or two or a very small number frequently proves the occasion of a very general concern among a whole people. Everything now begins to put on a new face. Ministers are animated. Christians are solemn. Sinners are alarmed. The house of God is thronged with anxious worshipers. Opportunities for prayer and religious conference are multiplied. Breathless silence pervades every seat and solemnity every bosom. Not an eye wanders. Not a heart is indifferent while eternal objects are brought near and eternal truth is seen in its wise, wide connections and in its quickening and condemning power. The Lord is there. His stately steppings are seen. His own almighty and invisible hand is felt. His spirit is passing from heart to heart in his awakening, convincing, regenerating, and sanctifying agency upon the souls of men. Those who have long been careless and indifferent to the concerns of the soul are awakened to a sense of their sinfulness, their danger, and their duty. Those who have cast off fear and restrained prayer have become anxious and prayerful. Those who have been stout-hearted and far from righteousness are subdued by the power of God and brought nigh by the blood of Christ. The king of Zion takes away the heart of stone and gives the heart of flesh. He causes the captive exiles to hasten that he may be loosed, lest he die in the pit and his bread should fail. 
He takes off the tattered garments of the prodigal, clothes him with the best robe, and gives him a cordial welcome to all the munificence of his grace. He brings those who have been long in bondage out of the prison house, knocks off the chains, and bind them down to sin and death, bestows the immunities of his sons and daughters, and receives them into a glorious liberty of the children of God. Now, if you were totally biblically literate, you would know that I have just given you a long series of quotations from the Holy Scriptures tied together in a string defining what happens when revival comes. And is there anything in all this so full of mystery that it has no claim to our confidence. Behold that thoughtless man, year after year has passed away, while he has been adding sin to sin, and heaping up wrath against the day of wrath. But the Spirit of all grace suddenly arouses him in his mad career, The conviction is fastened upon his conscience that he is a sinner. Fallen by his iniquity, he views himself obnoxious to the wrath of an offended God. He sees that he is under the dominion of a carnal mind. His sins pass in awful review before him, and he's filled with keen distress and anguish. He is sensible that every day is bringing him nearer to the world of perdition. And he begins to ask, Is there any hope for a wretch like me? But oh, how his strength withers. How his hope dies. He is as helpless as he is wretched, and as guilty as he is helpless. The arrows of the Almighty stick fast within him. The poison whereof drinketh up his spirit. But behold him now in the last extremity as he is cut off from his final hope. The arm of sovereign mercy is suddenly made bare for his Relief. The heart of adamant stone melts. The will that his heretofore resisted the divine spirit and rebelled against the divine sovereignty is subdued. The lofty looks are brought low. The selfish mind becomes benevolent. The pride is humbled. The stubborn Rebel becomes the meek child of God. Jesus tells the despairing sinner where to find a ray of hope. The voice of the Son of God proclaims forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The angel of peace invites and sweetly urges the soul stained with pollution to repair to the blood of sprinkling. Those stung with the guilt of sin are invited to look up to Jesus for healing and life. Is this an idle tale? Nay, believer, you have felt it all. This is the end of the first part of this program. To continue... Please proceed to disc two. And if there is no mystery in this for an individual, why should it be thought incredible that instances of the same nature should be multiplied and greatly multiplied in any given period? If there are dispensations of grace, 
above the ordinary operations of the Spirit. They may exist in very different degrees at different times. And if the immediate and special influences of the Holy Ghost are to be expected in the edification of a single saint or the conversion of a single sinner, why may they not be expected in the edification and conversion of multitudes? It is not above the reach of God's power nor beyond the limits of his sovereignty. God can as easily send down a shower as a single drop. He can as easily convert two as one, three thousand as one hundred, thirty million, I add, as five hundred thousand. Now this is a revival of religion. We do not pretend to have traced the features it uniformly bears because it bears no uniform features. God is sovereign. He does whatever he wills. The wind bloweth where it listeth. Still, wherever God is pleased to manifest his power and his grace in enlarging the views, in enlivening, and invigorating the graces of his own people, and in turning the hearts of a considerable number of his enemies at one and the same time to seek and secure his pardoning mercy. There is a revival of religion. Isn't that simple and clear? Let me repeat again, if God can save one, and we all know that he can because he saved us. If he can save two and do it in the same service, is there any reason he can't save 10,000 at once? Or 30 million or more in the space of a few weeks? People need the Lord. And in seasons of sovereign mercy, as it's as if the grace of God is unleashed like a mighty flood. And there have been times when entire nations have been awash with the glory of God. And multitudes of sinners have fled to the Redeemer and have found themselves totally transformed, new Creatures in Christ Jesus. And as I have tried to put in front of you already, what else is going to turn men and women, boys and girls, by the millions to our Lord Jesus Christ? So in the days of Hezekiah, after something that was wrong, was recognized. And after something that must be done, was done. A summons was sent throughout the land to assemble in Jerusalem for the observance of the Passover. And I shall not read the whole passage. I hope that you have done so in preparations. But as we noted a few minutes ago, the couriers met with success so that incredibly large crowds of people came into Jerusalem. The hand of God was on Judah. Look, if you will, at verse 12 of chapter 30. The hand of God was also on Judah to give them one heart to do what the king and the princes commanded by the word of of God. And without reading the precious account, they observed the Passover for seven entire days without a break. And so fragrant was the presence of the Lord, and so precious the renewal 
of being restored in their relationship to him and having things indeed set right that had so long been wrong. They determined to celebrate yet another seven days. So for 14 days running, they were blessed with the most glorious Passover that anyone could possibly imagine. And we read something of the specifics of what took place. The Feast of Unleavened Bread, as I said, celebrated first seven, then seven more days with great joy, as is pointed out again in verse 23, the whole assembly decided to celebrate another seven days, and uh, then in verse 25 and in 23, celebrate another seven days with joy in 25, and all the assembly of Judah rejoiced with, with the priest and the Levites, and in verse 26, so there was great joy in Jerusalem because there was nothing like this in Jerusalem since the days of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, and that was a long time earlier. And something of the magnitude is expressed in verses 24 uh, to 26. Hezekiah himself contributed a thousand bulls and seven thousand sheep. The princes contributed a thousand bulls and ten thousand sheep. Imagine, imagine, imagine such monstrous numbers as those. All the assembly rejoiced. When revival comes, something wonderful happens. Let me take a moment to make a sword thrust, I hope, to your own heart. As I have tried to make it clear, revival is nothing less than God himself in the midst of his people. Some of you know that the first time I wrote a book on the subject of revival, I began it by defining revival. I felt, well, there are all these notions out there what revival is. The least that I can do is to say this is what I'm talking about. No matter what you think revival is, if you read this book, this is what the focus is. And I said revival is an extraordinary work of the Spirit of God producing extraordinary results. And that is certainly true. If you know anything about revival, you know how truly extraordinary it is. And while I still stick by that definition, I've come to realize It can be stated so simply, as I just did. Revival is God in the midst of his people. Why is it that millions turn to Christ in times of revival? Do you realize that in 1857 and 1858, as a result of a prayer meeting that began in the Dutch Reformed Church on Fulton Street in New York City, Prayer meetings sprang up all across the land and there were at least two million people who joined the churches and said their conversion occurred in connection with that mighty revival of religion. Now that's 1857 and 1858. What was the population of America at that time? Well, none of our learned scholars dare speak up lest they might possibly be wrong. And I'm not a learned scholar, just an old man trying to serve the Lord. But we all know it was a mere fraction of the population today. Let us say it was one-eighth of today's population. So we multiply two million by eight. Imagine 16 million 
genuine, not Southern Baptist converts. <laughs> not even Presbyterian or Congregational converts, but converts made by the Holy Spirit. Genuine, real, enduring. Imagine what would happen in America if 16 million people were genuinely converted in a few short months. And that's what happens in revival. Surely you understand this by now. How many times have I already said at these Cedars conferences, if one were to try and be technical and say, is there a difference between a revival and an awakening? We could say, revival is that which happens to the people of God. People who have known life the life of God in their soul, and have allowed sin to creep in, and have allowed the weights of this life to bring them down. They have lost in a measure the life of God in their soul. They no longer have that uh, brilliance to them. They no longer have the same uh, degree of resolution. They, they have... Uh, toned it all down very considerably. And suddenly, the Spirit of God is there. And the life comes sweeping back in to believers. And uh, they have it in their heart to right every wrong that happened during their season of declension. And they make restitution and they go about with their apologies and with their careful concerns to right the wrongs of those days of declension. And uh, they head for the local store. When the storekeeper, on Monday morning, parks his car, comes around from the alley behind and approaches his door, he says to himself, Oh, good night. What a rotten way to start a new week. There's Deacon Smith from the First Baptist Church. I was hoping this would be a pretty good week, but now it's all ruined. That scoundrel. But what's he to do? He's a shopkeeper. So he tries to brush past the man and open the front door. And the deacon says, Sir, you don't know this, but over the last three years, I have been stealing from you. What do you mean, I don't know this? You think I'm an ignorant, an idiot, blind? Of course I know what a scoundrel you are. In a home meeting in Wheaton, Illinois, a woman spoke up and said, Mr. Roberts, I work in, and she named a large bank in our city, and she said, every time a prominent member of your church approaches the bank, the manager immediately alerts everyone to be on the watch because of this scoundrel. Not very good news. But every church has people who have committed wrong. And come back to my store illustration. You don't know that I've been stealing from you. Well, I certainly do. But I'm here to make it right. Now, I've been up all night trying to calculate the value. And as near as I can tell, it comes to $1,200. And I sense it with interest. I ought to give you $2,500. But to be honest, I don't have that much on hand. But I was able to get together $700, which I have here in cash, and I have this IOU for the other 1800 Well, now... Now, I have to admit, I never expected that. 
And off the man goes with the promise, I'll be back at the end of the week with the rest of the money. And a little while later, a boy slips in and says in a stuttering voice, I, I stole a candy bar here three weeks ago. And I've come to make that right. How many people are going to have to come to that shopkeeper and right the wrong before that shopkeeper is asking, what is going on at First Baptist Church? And believe me, if there's a meeting that night, there is the high probability that he will be there to discover what turned rank hypocrites into real Christians. So when we try to distinguish between a revival and an awakening, we say revival begins in the church when believers get right with God and with their fellow man. And when believers get right with God and their fellows, then their fellows come rushing to Christ to discover the reality for themselves of genuine Christianity. Can you feel any of that in your spirit? Do you have any sense of longing that might be expressed in these simple words? Lord, do it again! Do it again! Do it again! But as I have suggested to you, there are four parts to this passage. And I've just given an illustration of what I have hoped to draw to your attention in the fourth part. First, something is wrong. Second, something must be done. Third, something must happen. And finally, something must change. So let's move along to that aspect of the truth. Look at chapter 31 at verse 1. Now when all this was finished, all Israel who were present went out to the cities of Judah, broke the pillars in pieces, cut down the Asherim, pulled down the high places, pulled down the altars throughout all Judah and Benjamin, as well as Ephraim and Manasseh, until they had destroyed them all. Then all the sons of Israel returned to their cities, each to his possession. And verses 2 and 3. The priesthood and the sacrificial system were restored. He appointed the divisions of the priest. He restored burnt offerings and peace offerings. He reestablished praise and thanksgiving. He appointed the king's portion of his goods for burnt offerings according to to the law of the Lord. What I've tried to point out to you in these messages is there is something that we can do under the present circumstance and must do. But when revival comes, there are still things to be done that we can't do apart from the empowerment of the Holy Spirit. And it's wonderful to see how at least some of these precious things are laid out. Look now at verses 4 to 19. One of the truly precious things that happens in revival is that the purse strings of the people of God are loosed. And awakened people assume the command to support the Lord's Work. Verse 4, Hezekiah issued a command that the people support the priesthood so that they could devote themselves to the law of the Lord. Someone asked me yesterday, during this period in which the temple was locked and the lights were off and there were no sacrifices and offerings being made, what were the priests doing? Well, they weren't receiving their income either. So I'm assuming they went to work somewhere and had to pay their own way. But now, 
The spirit of revival is upon the people, and they're commanded to support the priesthood. And so, a revived people, verse 5, immediately poured out their abundance in tithes and offerings. As soon as the order spread, the sons of Israel provided in abundance the first fruits of grain, new wine, oil, honey, and all of the produce of the field, and they brought in abundantly the tithe of all. And if we were to read the whole section, you would quickly see that a huge heaps of surplus built up. And it became necessary uh, to uh, provide storehouses and protection for this vast array of things that was brought in in response to the order to take seriously the commands to support the work of the Lord. The Levitical priesthood itself was revived, verses 13 to 19. And Hezekiah was greatly helped. And we read in verses 20 and 21, he did what was good, right, and true before the Lord his God. Every work which he began in the service of the house of God, in law and in commandments, seeking his God, he did with all his heart, and prospered. And while we shall not read the section, starting in chapter 32, at verse 1, Zanacrib, king of Assyria, came, and he invaded Judah, and he besieged the fortified cities, and he thought to break into them for himself. And if you were to read the passage, you would see that he issued a series of taunts and jeers against Israel. He sought to frighten them. He said to them that uh, he had conquered every other people that he had set out to conquer. And why should they be so stupid as to listen to Hezekiah and to think that Hezekiah's God was any stronger than the gods of all the other lands? And some of the people were frightened. But Hezekiah and certain of his beloved brethren knelt together in prayer and sought the face of God. And God inspired him with spiritual wisdom. He acted very, very appropriately. They rebuilt the wall. They erected towers. They built an outside wall. They strengthened Milo in the city of David. They made weapons and shields in great numbers. They cut off the water uh, to the surrounding area so that the king of Assyria uh, would not find the, the pleasant circumstances he hoped for. They appointed military officers over the people. And he spoke encouragingly to them, be strong and courageous. Don't fear. Don't be dismayed. And to Sennacherib's surprise, his army was put to flight by an angel of the Lord. And when he returned home in defeat, his own family rose up and put him to death. And as we all know, we are facing an enemy much more powerful than Sennacherib. An enemy who believes their God is greater than our God. And because as a nation we are largely without a God, and because we as Christians have been more dependent upon our arm of strength, than the Lord. If we were a more sensible people, we would be frightened nearly out of our skin. So frightened that we would face realistically the fact our one hope is that the Lord ceases to be our enemy. 
Have you faced that? Do you know Isaiah 63 and 64? When the Lord is angry with his people, he becomes their enemy. He fights against them. You've heard people say, if God is for us, who can be against us? But if we were wiser, we would be saying right now, if God is against us, what does it matter who is for us? The enemy we now face is the greatest enemy this nation has ever faced. And they're going to win this war unless God himself steps in and saves us. And right now, our nation doesn't want God's help. They will not seek it. But have you not found already that part of what it means to be an intercessor is to pray for those too stupid to pray for themselves, to take their place at the throne of God, and here, those of us who've gathered at the cedars must understand that that is indeed our task. For a moment, will you simply think about what it means to have God as our greatest enemy? Now, God was against Hezekiah and his people, and he was their enemy. But they came to realize something was wrong, and that something must be done, and they did it. And God renewed his commitment to Judah. And when faced with Zanacharib, God himself, brought the victory to Judah. And it is surely my hope and prayer that as you return to your home and your place of service, it will be as an intercessor who is taking the place of those who ought to pray for themselves but haven't the grace to do so. And as an intercessor for the nation and the nations, so that indeed God may spare us and multitudes of others. But as we come to the close of my part of this series, it would be nice to leave the next part out, but it is terribly instructive. And it is part of the passage, and sheer faithfulness requires that I draw your attention to it. After this incredible Passover, after this glorious victory that uh, God gives to Hezekiah and to Judah, a very critical danger arises. My friends, do you all understand that you are never in greater danger than when you've been on the mountaintop with God? We are at our most vulnerable moment when God has done something truly extraordinary. Can you call to mind what happened to Moses at the end of his life? when the murmuring people, once more on the subject of water, 
were making their complaints known to Moses. At the waters of Meribah, and God, in his great kindness, suddenly came. And Aaron and Moses fell on their faces before God, for God manifested himself to them. And God had given a simple command to Moses. Moses, speak to the rock. But finally, after 40 years of their nonsense, Moses lost his temper. And he took the rod that was in his hand and he whacked the rock. On another occasion, he had been told to do that. One of the reasons we have to listen so carefully to the Lord is that his instructions may be very different than they were the last time. Moses, speak to the rock. Instead, he whacks the rock. The waters gush out. There's plenty for the people and their beast. But the Lord said, because you did not maintain my holiness before the people, you have forced me to maintain it at your expense. Now go up on the mountain where you can look across and see the land of promise. And after you've had the view, lie down and die. And Moses protested. He prayed. He pled with God. Oh, God, that's too severe. Oh, God, please, won't you let me finish my life call? Won't you let me lead your people into the land of promise? Go up on the mountain and lie down and die. And the only concern some seem to have is, did Moses lose his salvation? What nonsense. I know something worse than losing my salvation. That's failing my Lord after 72 years of labor and being told to lie down and die before my life work is finished. Whenever we fail to maintain the glory of God, when because of us, God is required to maintain his glory and his holiness at our expense. And we are prevented from finishing our life work because God is truly a holy God. That in my mind is far worse than going to hell. You may not think so. But my understanding of salvation is that I am dead to myself and alive in Christ Jesus. And my great task is to bring him glory and to maintain his holiness before the people. And if I can't maintain his holiness, if I can't bring him glory, what does heaven mean? And if you haven't been sufficiently saved from yourself to be more concerned about the glory of God than about your own salvation, you have grave reason to wonder whether you have even the first inkling of what it means to be saved. An old Welsh hymn cried out, Oh, to be saved from myself, dear Lord. Oh, to be lost in thee. Oh, that it may be no more I, but thou who dwells in me. And here's Hezekiah at the end of this incredibly glorious and victorious life who, because of the 
splendor and majesty of the great things that God did is highly honored among the people and elevated. They bring him rich gifts and they exalt him so that all the nations in the surrounding world are aware of Hezekiah and his mighty labor. And he's lifted up with pride. And in his pride, God brings him under judgment. And then, because there is yet grace despite the pride, he humbles himself. And he pleads with God for forgiveness and grace. And God says, all right, Hezekiah, you have sinned grievously, but because you have humbled yourself, that judgment which was to fall upon you will be withheld. And if you were to look in the beginning of the next chapter, 33, you would see that his son, Manasseh, isn't it? ruled in his stead. And like his own father, that is like Hezekiah's father, Ahaz, Manasseh did evil in the sight of the Lord. And all the evils that had been cleaned up and put away under Hezekiah came back in greater force and power. And the nation was then at its tail end. Just a few more miserable years, and they were carried away into captivity. Let me repeat again, you're never in greater danger than when you're on the mountaintop with God. And does it not break your heart to realize that Hezekiah, with all the incredible wisdom and help that he received from the Lord, did not guard his heart against pride in the end. And while God in his sovereign mercy was good to Hezekiah, despite his awful sin, Hezekiah's failure resulted in the final destruction of the land he loved and served so well. Is there not a powerful lesson here for us? Oh, I would say nothing whatsoever to discourage you from praying for revival. But now listen carefully. When revival comes, somebody's going to be exalted. That's the nature of revival. You look through the history of revivals, and time after time, you'll see unknown men and women suddenly elevated when young George Whitfield was converted in the 1730s. And suddenly, thrust in front of the entire United Kingdom, and the young boy suddenly drawing crowds of 20 and 30 and 40,000 people preaching in the open air, every church in London clamoring for him to come and preach there. Organized police officials required to escort him from place to place because the crowds were so great they would have shredded him to pieces. His name was all abroad in the land. And when he came shortly to the United States, the town criers would pass through the towns and on into the next and the next, and they would shout, 
Whitfield is coming. 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 And tens of thousands of people would gather from every corner of the region to hear this boy preach. And God only knows the number of converts. But by divine grace, he understood how easily he could be exalted in his own mind. And he pled constantly with God that he would never take any credit for that which God was doing. But if you pray for revival, and God in his grace sends it through you, Will you have the humility to be totally obedient to the Lord? Or will you Moses-like strike the rock? Will you Hezekiah-like let it go to your head? You see, part of what it means to pray for revival is to get ready. So that when revival comes, you will not draw the glory away from the Lord yourself. Do you understand that in true revival it is in a most incredibly glorious way all eyes on Jesus Christ. And what does Satan have to do to destroy a revival? Obviously he has only to draw eyes away from Christ. He can draw them to you, sir. He can draw them to some Silly doctrine that you push and pervert. He he can draw attention to some wild action, rolling on the floor, or being taken with the jerks, or gathering around a tree and barking as if you were dogs. All of these things and many more have happened. But brothers and sisters, while we pray with all our hearts, for an outpouring of the Spirit of our God, let us pray that we ourselves will never, ever touch the glory. I can't imagine anything more disappointing personally than to have given an entire lifetime to pleading with people to return to God and then to see a glorious awakening come and then to be the individual that destroyed the work by my own pride. Will we go away? Knowing something is wrong, something must be done, something must happen, and something must change. And the greatest of the change is the change that must occur in us who pray for revival, that indeed the glory will be all his. Well, Lord, you're well aware that we're here tonight and that it is the truth of your word that we have sought to face honestly. And you're better aware than any of us of the evil of our own heart. And you know how many times some of us have determined to persevere in faith and to claim in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ a great awakening for our land and then have quickly forgotten our resolution. And you know how some of us, even if a single convert occurs, 
under the guise of giving you thanks, crow and strut everywhere, humbly letting people know our part. You know how evil our hearts are. But by your grace, we know how mighty your salvation is. And we pray that every believing man and woman here tonight will find that in praying for revival, salvation is advancing rapidly in their own life, and that indeed the very God of all power shall manifest in the days and weeks in front of us a greater power of holiness in our lives than we've ever before known. And grant that when in grace revival comes, we will be those who will be enabled to keep it in such a way that all eyes remain perpetually upon you. If there is a lack of faith in some, or a lack of courage in others, Will you in your grace make up for our wants through your glorious provisions so that without exception we shall all claim in the name of Jesus an incredible advance of the kingdom of God in our own day. Give us whatever it takes to appropriately follow through we plead in the strong name of King Jesus. Amen.